Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for being with us today. Today is Tuesday, March the 10th, 2015. This is a regular voting meeting of the Prescott City Council. Uh, any introductions, Chris, that uh, you'd like to make? No, I think we're going to be here late enough, Mayor. Let's roll. Okay. We're honored today again to have uh, Pastor Jesse Lyles of the Willow Hick Willow Hills Baptist Church to give the invocation and uh, then I will lead the pledge. Uh, join me in prayer. Father God, we, uh, we pause at the beginning of this meeting here to give you thanks that we live in a beautiful town like this. The skies are blue and, and the trees are budding, bursting forth with flower and color. Thank you, Lord, for the country we live in and for all the uh, folks who have helped to make this country what it is. Lord, as we gather here on this day, Lord, we know there are issues to be resolved within this community as any other. So Lord, help us to come to those uh, as a community and work through the, any differences that we may have and be united in our effort uh, to, uh, uh, to be a, a, a city, a town that loves one another. So thank you, Lord, for your presence. We pray for your leadership, your guidance here in this time. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Join me in the pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Mayor Kirkendall? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Cookneo? Here. Councilman Arnold? Here. Councilman Blair? Yes. Councilman Lamerson? Here. Councilman Lazelle? Here. Councilwoman Wilcox? Here. All present. Okay. Any announcements, uh, manager? Okay. Let's move right on to the consent agenda, please. Um, consent agenda, item 1A, approval of minutes for the city council meetings held on January 27th, 2015, January 30th, February 10th, and February 12th, 2015. Item B, adoption of resolution number 4281-1490, accepting an, an Arizona Department of Homeland Security grant program award in the total amount of $23,300 for confined space rescue equipment for the Prescott Fire Department. Okay. Comments, Council? Questions? Everybody agree? Do you have a motion? Make a motion we approve the consent agenda. Second. second. Motion made and seconded. Vote, please. Passes okay. unanimously. Okay, let's uh, <coughs> move along to the regular agenda. Item A. Item 2A, public hearing and consideration of a liquor license application for a Series 6 all spiritus liquor and bar license from Cliff Jeffrey Probowski, applicant for Plaza View Ballroom, Old Capital Market, located at 120 West Gurley Street, Suites A, B, and M. Mayor and Council, Mr. Probowski is requesting a person location transfer for a Series 6 bar license for the Plaza View Ballroom. The police department has reviewed the application and found it to be in compliance with state law. The community development department has reviewed the application and found it to be in compliance with zoning requirements and building safety issues. The application and license fees have been paid. The application has been posted at the proposed location for the required 20 days. There have been statements of opposition filed, which were included in the council packet. The statements of opposition received specify if the liquor license for the Plaza View Ballroom is approved, it will prohibit Superstition Meadery, the winery and tasting room located at the bottom floor at 120 West Gurley from selling bottles of wine for off-sale consumption, distributing to their accounts, or selling Arizona wine. The opposition states the reason is due to ARS 2-44.40, which prohibits a retailer to knowingly allow a customer to bring spiritus liquors on a licensed premises. The applicant has filed an amended floor plan with the city and with the Arizona Department of Liquor to address the concerns raised by Superstition Meadery. And you have that passed out to you. Um, the applicant, as well as the owners of Superstition Meadery, are in attendance and we can answer any questions you might have. Okay. Is the applicant here? Cliff, uh, won't you come on up and uh, we'll let the council uh, <coughs> talk to you first and then uh, we'll go to the public uh, or if you'd like to make a statement first well that's that's fine also all right thank you mayor and councilman councilwoman um just for background uh i bought the um the, the burmeister building about three years ago uh the upstairs hadn't been opened up in 70 years it didn't have a sprinkler system um it didn't really have adequate electric 
And so I went through the re remodel of putting in an elevator, putting in the electrical, and opening up that upstairs as well as you know refurbishing the downstairs and putting in a mezzanine at the building. Um, uh, the um, the uh, the metery, which is my tenant in the basement, you know, we're having a, uh, some differences <coughs> over um, this access that they're talking about. And what it involves is, if you look at your diagram from the entrance to the exit, um, you know, there there is a statute that says that you can't carry liquor from one premise through another licensed liquor premise. And so uh, I had hired a liquor consultant four months ago, and the special circumstances is where you see the front door and the back door is that the winery, which just sells wine and makes wine, um, liquor, the, my liquor consultant went to the state, and the state, uh, the state said, well, if they're, if they're packaging their bottle of wine in, the, in a bag, and being that it's a historic building, that it should be okay. So upon his recommendation, I proceeded with that yeah, I proceeded with the process. Um, my original application didn't have that that four foot high railing. Um, so um, so what I did at that point, uh, and I, w I was uh, I wasn't aware that as I had talked to the owners of Superstition Meadery four months ago and um, had told them that I had bought a Class 6 license. So, um, so what's resulted is, is I put a railing so that what I have in essence done is I've created a walk through from the elevator from their space where no liquor can be saw, uh, sold and they still have the exit and the entrance. So um, this seems to be fine with the uh, um, the acting um, commissioner in charge of the liquor board right now. There's been some changes since our new governor's in place. Um, so I had talked with uh, one of the owners of Superstition Meadery last week. It's never been my intention to try to limit their sales or do anything to the contrary. And um, so that's where we're at right now. I don't know if they're, they're fine with this and that um, We've come to a resolution, but I'll be happy to answer any questions after that you might have or after any concerns they may bring up. Charlie. Uh, Mayor, I'm going to wait, actually, if I could, till we hear from the meadery. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. A uh, couple questions, sir. Uh, on the suite A, B, and M, what, um, what is considered A? Is that all of that floor right there? Well, the, um, um, the A is the main floor, yes. Okay, so that would be considered all that floor. And then yes. B is... Well, actually, is actually, it, actually, no. It's now been pulled back and just covers the, the M now is, uh, under the amendment is just the area inside of the, okay. the guardrail. And the M is the mezzanine. Okay. Which, which is in another diagram. And then B is the mezzanine up above there, the... the Kind of the balcony that the surrounds that. No, uh, uh, on the on the second floor is the ballroom. Okay, and then M is what? That's the mezzanine. The mezzanine. Okay, all right. Uh, two other quick questions for you. The can't even read my own writing without my glasses. Your um, liquor consultant. Did he get that in writing from the uh, state that there was no problems with? Uh, there's not going to be a conflicting problems. Well, I. Um, I don't know that the liquor board d does that, but there you should have a copy of an email with uh, the attached amendment that says that the uh, that it doesn't seem like it'll be a problem, and that would be uh, um, Wes Cool's email. Okay, so that's not actually from the board of l the liquor board or the yes, yes. I don't see that. It is the document attached to the back of the map. That's from West Cool. He's from the Department of Liquor. Oh, thank you. Oh, Arizona Liquor. That would be that. Okay, thank you. Okay, Jane. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Mr. Petrovsky, on your amended diagram, what does SE mean? Where those two little openings are next to the elevator? Now, there's a key further down, and that's for signage. Uh, Signed exit. Yes. yes. That's an exit only? 
No, no, no. Just uh, um, signage uh, designating no alcohol, alcohol. So it's the the fence is actually impassable. There's no gate in and out. There's openings there where it says SE where there's a break. There'll be ingress coming in the front door, signage there uh, relating to alcohol, and then the opening by the, the E there is the elevator. Um, the, you can see the walkthrough going back and then the exit in back, further back. Um, you know, there'll, there'll be a walkthrough as well. And you're saying that the email that's attached from Wesley Cool indicates that this All I would be acceptable under the liquor license law and wouldn't, and wouldn't stop the metery from their current mode of business? Not at all, because I'm, I'm just licensing so they have access from the entrance to the exit. So right. it's, not a, it's not a licensed liquor establishment walking through and going down the stairs or down the elevator to their facility. It was my understanding that there had to be a non-passable barrier between two bars on the same premises. That's true, but, but the, this bar doesn't start to the other side of that fence now. So okay. liquor, liquor can't go outside of that fence, so now they have an unobstructed entrance and exit out the back. And you do intend to operate a bar on the first floor? Don't know. I don't know if the uh, my Class Six liquor license it will include uh, uh, wine and liquor for the ballroom upstairs, possibly the mezzanine. I'm talking to, uh, to some tenants about a, uh, a deli sandwich shop, um, but I think the Class Six is inclusive of of all of those things. Well, on your application, question number six is what type of business will this license be used for? And you replied bar. Well, I guess that's the broadest, the broadest definition. I don't have a tenant right now on that, on that floor. Uh, let me ask a question right here in the middle. Uh, Cliff, you have a number six. Yes. And a number six allows on-site open containers a bar but also a number six allows you to sell packaged liquors off premises as they can buy a bottle from the bar and as long as it's not open can be carried off the premises so that's uh, that's what a number six allows you to do uh, it gives you full discretion and uh, so the the package goods from the metery, metery will be in a closed container. Uh, once they leave the metery, they'll that will have to remain closed until they leave the building. Am I correct on that? That's correct. Okay. And if you sell a package good to leave the facility, it will have to be re remain sealed until it's left the building. That's correct. But you will be able to sell uh, goods at a bar on the facilities on either the first or second floor with a number six. Am, am I yes. understand that? Yes. Okay. Uh, Cliff or uh, Chris? Yeah, you know, it's funny, Mayor. I've been called Charlie twice today, so Cliff isn't too bad. I'm a man of many names. Uh, I talked with Mr. Uh, Herbert. He came in City Hall uh, last week and started discussing and uh, kind of emphasized with him. He um, is starting a business. You know, first time around, they've sunk everything they got into this business. Uh, told a good story about what they were doing. Um, talked about the problems they were having with this uh, liquor license coming in, and uh, I told him that I would intercede and help I, you know I I serve with uh, Cliff on the uh, PDP board I know him so uh, made a phone call uh, we talked a little bit uh, Cliff said that he would write a letter that that he'd signed that would say that anything any if his liquor license uh, interfered at all with the way that the metery was doing business he wouldn't pursue it and I think you even authored the letter I mean I, I think I saw it the other day right correct you send it by and uh, the problem was, is I think it was the day after, or the, the day after that, the, this uh, internet 
Facebook kind of uh, campaign was launched. And I think, it, I think it's just a rookie mistake, but uh, you don't demonize somebody from what I saw as a publicity stunt. And uh, I see their, their fears were real. And you have to bring attention to that. But I think I was working towards resolution. I felt a little bit, uh, a little bit betrayed because I was trying to work towards that solution. I thought we were getting to that solution. And then, you know, I'm sorry that this internet campaign came out that was slamming you on a personal basis. Um, maybe it was just a, a, a rookie mistake, but I don't think that's the way to do business. Um, I'm glad to see that you come up with this fence idea that's going to let everybody live in peace and harmony. And uh, I look forward to going down there. I saw the pictures of the meadery on the website. Looks like a beautiful place down there, nice colors. Um, I think we can move forward with this because it looks like it's not going to harm anyone the way it's set up right now. I just wish things would have been handled a little bit differently, and I think we, they were on their way to be handled differently. So I just had to get that off my chest, Mayor. Sorry. Mayor, Sorry. I do have a question for uh, the clerk. I've had a chance to read through this. Have you spoken to DLLC since this or in, in the last few days? Yes, I spoke to the Department of Liquor, West Cool, yesterday. Um, he, again, of course, didn't commit one way or the other, but he did go through the process on, on what they do. But he said that, you know, the city runs their, their process for approval. The state also runs their own process, meaning that um, they do the same background checks and looking at yep. the businesses. Um, but he did indicate that he thought that, that resolution had been reached and he was comfortable with that. Okay. Uh, of course, in a non-committal way. Right. Of course. Yeah, he's not the director, so he yeah. can't do it. <laughs> I understand that. <laughs> Thank you. Charlie, did you want to talk to uh, the owner of the meadery? Yep, if, if we're to desire? that point, yes, sir. I just would like okay. to hear from them and see if this is doable, and then we can go from there. And Charlie, could I ask Cliff just one more question, Mayor? Um, Cliff, if uh, your liquor license interferes in any way with the operation of the meadery as it sits right now, would you still pursue the liquor license? Um, I, I probably would alter it some, but I, you know, I have a lot going on with the ballroom and some other things. And just to clarify is, is that their objection is, is this very specific little code that, um, that they're talking about going from one licensed liquor establishment from another. And I have eliminated that problem here. Um, those addresses, when you, you would ask about the, the letters after the address, those are separate addresses identifying different parts of the building. And so this alleviates uh, everything to the left of your screen up there is not a licensed facility to sell alcohol. So they're in total compliance. Now if I have a, if they have another gripe with me next month about something, you know, that's something different. But, but their concern, their whole campaign has been, oh my God, you're going to shut us down because we can't walk a, you know, we can't sell a bottle walking up the stairs going out the front door or the back door. So I've gone to these extraordinary, I think that the state would have approved it as an exception because of it being a hundred year old historic building. So now I've, re now we've, we've amended it to pull everything back. And so they, their ingress and egress would, would keep them in compliance. Now, if they allowed liquor outside or wine up their stairs and, and they would be in non-compliance, and you know, I guess the liquor board does issue some citations, but but I believe that I've I've met the compliance. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mayor. I noticed on the date of the email to our clerk Dana DeLong that this amendment came in just this morning at 10:08 a.m. Has the uh, has the meadery had an opportunity to look at this amendment? Councilwoman Wilcox, I provided the meter yesterday with a, I got the diagram yesterday and then the, the email was sent today. So I re, have a provided the meter with the diagram. Okay, thank you. I also, to answer your question, when I, when I talked with um, um, Jen Herbert um, five days ago, I told her about this plan. I'd be happy to meet with her and show, show her the diagram. This was before it was a, approved as an amendment and didn't, did not hear back from Okay, thank you. 
and I'd like to comment if, if, if sure. I could again. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, thanks for being here. Is the someone here from the metery that would like to uh, speak to this? Come on down. Mr. Mayor and Council Members, thanks for uh, for having us here today. So, uh, just a really quick uh, recap. Uh, three weeks ago, when the license was posted, uh, one of our employees came up to us and said, "Hey, do you know there's a 13,000 square foot bar going in upstairs?" And we said no. So we went and looked at the application and called uh, the State Liquor Department and set up a meeting for the next week with uh, an investigator named Keith Trainer, and he came up and met with uh, with my wife, also an owner of the business. And he explained to us that as it was submitted at the time initially, that in fact, uh, we would not be able to sell uh, any bottles to go because we would basically be an island as you see on the map. So the way you access our premises is through the stairs uh, on the left or the elevator. So um, that was a huge concern to us because uh, you know, half of our revenue would have been uh, you know, eliminated. That would have been a, a go out of business scenario. So it was a big deal for us. And uh, after meeting with our lawyer, they recommended that we deal directly with uh, the state liquor department to come up with a resolution. And uh, they came up with, uh, you know, after uh, again meeting with us and uh, the applicant, uh, this concept of having a, a permanent barrier with some gates. And, uh, and we're good with that. So today, um, after a long couple of weeks, we're here to say thank you uh, to the council for all your support. And uh, I think that we can all move on and we look forward to having this behind us. Yeah. Good. Anyone on? No. I, I, it's great I, to ma have marriage counseling, yeah. isn't it? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I, th I think mutually it'll work out well because the traffic that we think will be generated upstairs will have to go by your place of business also. Yep. So uh, there may be an opportunity that uh, comes out of this for both of you. And, and our role is not to create or eliminate competition. It's to try to rule on the specifics of what some of the ordinances are. So, and uh, that's a tough one. Uh, I've been in that business, and uh, uh, it's it's sometimes it's tough to keep bottles not coming into your place of business. So, uh, uh, a lot of uh, discretion on on the customers themselves. Uh, I would say this to you: you've. Uh, You've got a pretty good customer base. I received, uh, I just received mine today, but a letter from some folks that live in St. Augustine, Florida, that are concerned that you stay in business also. So that's a good thing. So anything further? Do we have a motion to uh, close the public hearing? Mayor, I move to close the uh, public hearing. Second. M motion made and seconded, vote please. Passes unanimously. Okay, now we need a motion to uh, approve or deny Mayor, the recommendation, okay? I move to approve liquor license application number 0613002 for a Series 6 All Spiritus Liquor and Bar license for Plaza View Ballroom slash Old Capital Market located at 120 West Gurley Street, Suite A, B, and M. Second. And Mayor, before we vote, I'm sorry, will you be removing your formal protest then? Yes, we okay. uh, we have no challenge or protest to this. So, okay. thank again, you. thank you all for your support. And Mayor. Let us vote on it oh, first. Oh, 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 hold on, don't, please. Don't, don't get too fast. Uh, before <laughs> did, did we have a second? I think there was a second, but before you vote, I think you just need to add the words, as amended, uh, first, the first floor, the first floor floor plan as amended, so it's clear what the recommendation to the Liquor Board is. As amended. Okay. Amend the second. Get a second. Okay. A motion made and seconded. Vote, please. Good luck to you. Passes unanimously. You, sir. Good luck to you, too, Cliff. Okay. Okay. Item B. Item 2B Public hearing and consideration of a liquor license application for a Series 12 restaurant license from Julie Ann Rodriguez, applicant for Prescott Lobster and Seafood Company, located at 220 West Goodwin Street, number 2. Mayor and Council, Ms. Rodriguez is requesting a new Series 12 restaurant license for the Prescott Lobster and Seafood Company. The police department has reviewed the application and found it to be in compliance with state law. The community development department has reviewed the application and found it to be in compliance with zoning requirements and building safety issues. The application fees have been paid. 
The application has been posted at the proposed location for the required 20 days and no comments have been received and the applicant is present and available to answer questions. Are you the applicant? Yes, I am. Well, get up here. <laughs> Good afternoon. You ready to be grilled? Yes, I am. Okay. <laughs> I was warned. <laughs> Tell us about what you're doing. I actually reopened the Prescott Lobster and Seafood Company um, last month. And um, when I was thinking about what I wanted to do, um, I kind of did my research and found out there's a lot of people from New England living in Prescott. They were really upset when it closed down December 2013. So I decided to actually maintain that New England dish like lobster rolls, clam chowder. So we make everything fresh and we just offer that hometown food to the people that can't get back to Boston or to Maine or anything. So I'm just getting a really nice response from the community. Very good. Now you're in the firehouse. Yes, Plaza. I am. Yeah. Now you're aware that the, uh, there'll be another liquor license upstairs Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, you're, not definitely. Wor you're not worried about that? No, not okay. at all. I all right. actually got to meet the new owners and really okay. excited that they'll be there. Okay. So. Council? Nothing? No questions? Oh, okay. We're halfway. <laughs> Do we have a motion? Move to close the public hearing. Second. Motion made and seconded. Vote, please. Passes <laughs> down. Okay. <coughs> have a motion to approve the uh, license. Move to approve. Uh, the recommendation for regular license application 12133611 for a series 12 restaurant license for Prescott Lobster and Seafood Company located at 220 West Goodwin Street, number two. Second. Okay, motion made and second to vote, please. Okay. Passes unanimously. Go for it. We're behind you. Thank you very okay. much. Item 2C, public hearing and consideration of a liquor license application for a Series 12 restaurant license from Schuyler Holt Reeves, applicant front Barley Hound, located at 234 South Cortez Street. Mr. Reeves is requesting a new Series 12 restaurant license for the Barley Hound. The police department has reviewed the application and found it to be in compliance. The community development department has reviewed the application and found it to be in compliance with zoning requirements and building safety requirements. Um, they have also indicated that there are no remaining issues with this application. The application and license fees have been paid. The application has been posted at the proposed location for the required 20 days and no comments have been received. And I believe the applicant is here to answer questions. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, you can pull it up, not have to bend over. There you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Council, questions? Tell us what you're doing. Uh, we're reopening the old Rose restaurant, so just a few steps down the street here. We're going to have a uh, kind of a gastro pub theme there with uh, craft beer, delicious food from locally sourced uh, produce and meats, and we're really looking forward to it. Yeah, sounds great. Uh, the note on our uh, agenda, uh, that's all clear now. Everything is. Yes, um, Chief Light can speak to that. Okay. Good afternoon, Chief. Good afternoon, Mayor Council. Uh, yeah, there were a few outstanding issues that were all came to fruition and resolution as of uh, this morning. And okay. uh, fire, and from what I understand from Tom Geis with community development, there's no issues that remain outstanding at okay. this time. Great, great. So all issues are settled. Okay, do you have a motion? <coughs> Move to close the public hearing. Second. Motion made and second. Vote, please. Passes unanimously. Thanks, folks. You have a motion to approve the license? Move to approve the recommendation for liquor license application 12133612 for a Series 12 restaurant license for Barley Hound located at 234 South Cortez Street. Second. Motion made and seconded. Vote, please. Passes unanimously. Okay, you're out of here. Where'd you go? Okay. Okay, let's move on to item D. Item 2D, approval of a downtown management agreement with the Prescott Downtown Partnership, PDP, for fiscal years 2015 to 2017, city contract number 2015-108. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. The item before you is a uh, downtown management contract with the Prescott Downtown Partnership, a nonprofit organization. The city and the uh, Prescott Downtown Partnership have had uh, agreements in place since uh, 2001. Uh, this agreement would be for a three-year period uh, effective through June 30th of 2017. Uh, some of the components of this agreement include the administration 
of the Prescott uh, Main Street Program uh, organization of uh, spe downtown special events, uh, encouragement and facilitation of the physical development of downtown. Uh, a new component would be the, uh, down to the uh, street pole banner project, which we discussed last week and uh, making sure that the uh, PDP uh, maintains the requirements for Prescott to retain its Arizona Main Street and National Main Street uh, designations. And then an annual report to uh, the City Council of prior year activities. Uh, the major change to this uh, agreement for this year uh, beyond the, uh, the banner project is uh, the way that uh, we're paying them. In prior years, there was a formula that was developed uh, before I arrived, it had something to do with a uh, collection of uh, uh, transient vendor permits, which go into general fund. Uh, this contract has been paid out of bed tax uh, as far as long as I can remember. So seeing no correlation between the two, we've just separated it out. Uh, that's been averaging somewhere between 16 and $18,000 per year. We upped it to an even 20 this year in recognition of the fact they're taking on additional responsibilities with regard to the uh, uh, manor program. So with that, uh, I believe Kendall Jaspers from the PDP as well as some of his board members are, are in attendance today. Myself or any one of them would be glad to answer any questions you may have. Okay, Jean. I had a couple questions on uh, Exhibit A, which lists organizations eligible for banners. Uh, one of those is multi-day events at Courthouse Plaza sponsored by the PDP or the Prescott Chamber of Commerce. Would that include the craft fairs that Nonprofit organizations have the only there's only uh, eight or actually there's nine multi-day events a year on the courthouse square um, Eight of them are crash shows and one's the the whiskey off-road so they would be able to post a banner advertising their commercial venture <laughs> Well, that's correct yeah. That seems to conflict with the statement and elsewhere in exhibit a that this is banners are not to be used for commercial advertising well there's some history to this craft show thing it didn't just pop out <laughs> anywhere <sure. laughs> are you interested or I mean we don't have to go through it but <laughs> part, part of it is it part of it is there because there's other events going on in town especially 4th of July and the idea is to try to hang on to the crowds um, so it just doesn't disappear after the parade or whatever you know or the rodeo okay well I have a problem with relaxing the rules for what seems to me to be a commercial uh, enterprise being held on the courthouse lawn. I think the banner should be used for events, uh, whether it's nonprofit, whether it's the rodeo or the symphony coming to town, but it's an event, something that will attract people to come downtown, attract tourists to come to Prescott, but not for retail sales at a craft fair that doesn't seem fair to me well i'm certainly you know it's certainly up to the city how they, however they want to structure that i mean i don't have i don't have any objection to tightening it up um i i would assume that any 501 company was or any 501 corporation is what we're thinking of well i i think what the reasoning there was that uh, those events are sponsored by a nonprofit. they are major events they do bring a lot of people in town um, so that was the reasoning that uh, we came up with, that uh, we believe that that uh, fits that definition, the event itself. The other question was, um, other city events at the discretion of the city of Prescott, who makes that decision? Who has the discretion? Well, I work directly with uh, uh, spe the special events, Becky Garvin and Joe Baines from Parks and Rec, and I also work directly with Don um, serve on the special event committee and pretty much do what they want me to do. I spend a lot of time on the whiskey off-road. Um, that's one that's a city-sponsored event that we work quite a bit with and we spent time with the sesquicentennial and the Arizona State Centennial. I mean those are the kinds of things that the city's direction. Uh, Mayor and Council and Councilwoman Wilcox, what we're intending to do is put together a committee between various city departments and the PDP to review those applications and it'll be determined by the committee. And as I mentioned last week, should in the unlikely event that we can't come to an agreement, then it would go up for the, the, the chain of command to city manager's office. 
Okay, I didn't find that anywhere in the contract that describes that procedure. Yeah, we, I, I think we did mention that uh, there would be a committee formed. Okay. Charlie. Mayor, thank you. Um, I'm going to come back to the banners in a second. Just some clarification because the, the wording's a little off. We're going to go to a flat fee for PDP. What happens to the vendor? The transient vendor fees? Thank you, yes. The, the city gets them as always. The city's okay. always gotten them. Um, we didn't act, the only, we didn't actually collect for the city or, or handle their money at all. We just, um, it was just a formula that came out when that was put in place. So that's some, just some clarification I think that is important for everyone to know. And then going to the banner program, which generally speaking I think is a valuable tool. I think it's something that we can use to promote quite a bit in the city. But let's talk about some examples where I think we could get a little sideways. And um, while I'm comfortable giving s some approval today, I think it will be necessary for you guys to tighten this up a little bit. But let's say that somebody does a beer garden on Cortez Street and it's a nonprofit and they come and they want all the banners on Whiskey Road to promote that. Is that allowed under the current structure? Don't know. I mean, this is kind of... In its infancy. Yeah, we're, this first year is going to be a learning process. That's not the object. The object is particularly events and venues that attract people from out of town. So far, there's been more interest from venues such as um, the rodeo grounds, mm -hmm. the, you know, things like that, than there have been in events. You know, and I suspect that's kind of going to be the way it goes. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to... You know, we're, we're going to have to talk our way through this. It's, you know, there's no doubt about it. And, and I don't disagree with that. I think that, and to Steve's point, you know, it, the only problem is that sounds like what happened with the Affordable Care Act is we'll approve it and hope it works. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm willing to stipulate no. whatever you'd like as far as banners it, go. And I mean, it's not, I don't think it's going to be, I think it's going to be, um, Again, venue driven. I don't think it's going to turn over a lot. I don't think it's cost effective for for uh, groups to come in and do something that where they run it for a month and and then take it down. Um, yep. You know, I, I really feel like there's there's other other methods for them available that are more efficient. They can get a banner permit from the city and and hang banners around town right. on on the on the streets um, a lot for less cost than what you know what this is. This is hopefully decorative and informational. And I, I, again, I think that that, is, that intent is important. Uh, you know, PDP has been a good partner to the city in handling a lot of these types of things, and I think that this is a direction we should go. Um, I'm just worried about some of the unintended consequences, is ultimately it's our phones that ring when um, something goes up that people aren't happy with. So, you know, if, as you guys are working through the trial and error portion, um, I would recommend you focus more on venues and city functions um, and refine this a little bit more before we open it completely to the public and all these nonprofits to come in and, and do this. I, I just think you're going to have some conflicts that need to be addressed. Yeah. Chris? Yeah, you know, uh, this banner program is, is brand new. We're starting out. One of the goals of the PDP is to bring consumers downtown. That's what they do with the events. The point of the banners is to bring them back. You know, when we have these events that go up, uh, after the event's over, they come down. They don't just stay up year-round. Is that correct? That if, if it has an expiration on it, yes. Now, a venue, no, not necessarily. So, but but if there's, if there, say, the Whiskey Off-Road is a classic. That's a city-sponsored event. Um, so that would obviously qualify for banner support if they wanted it. And that has specific dates. Once those dates are passed and there's an expiration date on that banner, it, it needs to come down. That's going to be part of the deal. So once it gets to that, it, it, it comes down and hopefully after that, um, we'll just say Prescott Frontier Days, banners would go up and the visitors that would be here for the uh, Whiskey Off-Road would now be directed to come back for Frontier Days. So we get the return tourism and that's one of the goals of this banner program. Absolutely. Um, also to send them to the museums. 
you know, and if you think about commercial ventures, the museums are commercial ventures too. They're also nonprofit, but these are things that we got to, we've never done a very good job at directing the tourists around Prescott. Hopefully this helps us uh, achieve that a little bit more because I know as a council we've been working on that. And this, this is very uh, close to me. I'm the liaison to the Prescott Downtown Partnership for the City Council. Um, I just like Kendall, you know, I, I've read this. It doesn't say everything you guys do. What, can, you got, can you list some of the other stuff that you do for the city as the Prescott Downtown Partnership? Sure. I actually brought a few notes just in case. Um, the Prescott Downtown par Partnership, in, in, you know, the bullet points are we operate and uh, we, we operate the downtown kiosk providing content, maintenance, and cleaning, the four kiosks downtown. Uh, we sponsor the flower basket program downtown which is one of the things we raise money for with our craft show. And uh, that, that, uh, that program costs about $8,000 a year to put on. Um, we uh, maintain the status as Main Street, uh, as a Main Street program. Um, there has been times in the past when that's been very, a really good deal for the city. Um, we got uh, some of the original decorative banners that were put up downtown were written off of a Main Street grant. Um, the light ring at the Elks Theater when the city was doing the restoration in there came from a Main Street grant. So there's been some good things. It's dried up a little in the last few years. but, but uh, And that program requires me to spend a certain amount of time in continuing education, including uh, the Arizona State Historical Preservation Conference every year. And uh, I usually attend the Rural Economic Development Conference also. Um, Let's see, we contract with Yavapai County to coordinate reservations on the, the courthouse square. That's a, we also serve on the city special events committee, and it's a real opportunity to work together between the two entities to see that we're not clogging up downtown. We've got a pretty good calendar going now. We're working hard to, to make sure that, that one event doesn't step on another one. Now, we sponsor the Elves Weekend Christmas promotion downtown. We spend a huge amount of time and money on the, hol on the holiday light parade. This year it was, uh, we probably drew somewhere in the five to 7,000 people range downtown. And then we had at least 1,000 people at our after party at the middle school. That was a new thing this year. So we held on to our crowd a little better and everybody seemed to like it. Um, with, with the chamber, we sponsor the courthouse lighting. Um, PDP writes an annual check for $5,000 to support that. We also run the Christmas, Arizona Christmas City Mug Program, and we raised another 3000 for the courthouse lighting directly with that effort. Um, and that doesn't count the amount of staff time we end up in with that. It's a bunch. Um, you know, Dave Maurer is our money guy. He handles that and works with the contracts, and I work with the screwing the light bulbs in and seeing that the warehouse is cleaned up and we've got everybody working on the right day. So it's, it's, it's a pretty big effort. Um, we've got a few new things. And I even made a note here. Um, well, as I mentioned, the after party, and we've talked about the banner program some. Um, at the request of, of the city, we're taking a hard look at uh, maybe expanding the courthouse lighting decorations to the uh, park at the intersection of 69 and 89. Um, that's something that we're working towards for next year, for, for this Christmas maybe. And uh, we're about to run into something with uh, Main Street. Uh, the reporting requirements for Main Street have, are gonna change. Uh, in the past, we were asked about uh, jobs created, new businesses open and closed. Uh, rehab projects completed, public improvement projects, public investment, private investment, and some things like that. Our new, to maintain our status this year, we're now going to need to inventory the number of downtown housing units, uh, the total number of commercial spaces and number of vacant spaces, and the average rental rate square foot and total square foot as possible. Now we're going to have to work some with the city to do that. I think Cat Moody and, and, and some of the community development folks will be involved too. But this is all information that's good for, the, for also for the economic development people too. I mean, we do a lot of legwork and uh, we certainly share the results with, with whoever can use it at the city. 
And when they do that business inventory, you guys have to walk into every single business downtown because the city of Prescott doesn't have a sales tax. We don't really know what's Well, we don't have a business license. Excuse me, business license. You have to walk downtown, and you guys do that every year. Um, the funding for this is coming out of bed tax, so it's being driven by tourism, and it's adding to tourism. It doesn't uh, come out of our general fund. But the biggest thing that I get when I see this is, you know, for $20,000, how much services are, is the city of Prescott getting out of the PDP? And what would it cost us if the PDP wasn't around and we had to hire someone to handle uh, these events and these happenings, not to mention that they have the donations? Um, it's been a pleasure working with you guys for the last three years, and I hope that we see fit to continue doing that this next year. Jim. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate it. Chris's comment. It almost makes me wonder why we have a tourism department at all, and special events people. I mean, we got volunteers doing it and doing a superb job. I mean, gosh, listen to what all you guys do. If I'm not mistaken, Kendall, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. The agreement that we had in the past, the dollars that were directed towards uh, a manager position of the PDP was actually spent somewhere different or spent from funds somewhere different like from the um, events you guys got to keep some of the money from the events uh, the booth rentals things like that well that was how the amount was determined was based on the city's collection of transient vendor permit fees but we didn't directly get the fees ever it was just a a measuring stick thank you it was a measuring yeah. stick and it was, yes. it was it was it was value based yes now we're changing from a value based mechanism to just a, a flat fee is that am I have I got this correct that's now? correct thank you thank you mayor uh, most of my questions were answered through uh, other questions asked by fellow councilmen um, one question I have, what, what is the appeal process? Let's say there's a downtown owner who has a grievance with something the PDP is doing. They're not a member of the PDP. What do they do? Come talk to us. And so, I, I mean, I guess, I, we have open meetings. Okay, we don't, I guess know, what I'm saying no. is we're giving you authorization, if this passes, to... Um, to go forth and do your do banners and hold events but if if there's a business that has a problem that's on downtown now we're deferring the appeal process to a non-government agency that really is not representing them correct well if there's there if there's anything to do with like banners um we there is a you know that does have a process in it that goes to uh city committee and then eventually could go to the city manager to do with it as he will so there is a process for that um, as far as actually running events we don't run ourselves a lot of specific events we run we run the fourth of july craft show uh, we run the light parade we run that l's weekend we run the after parade um, those are the things we do those are the events we do right but I mean, there's also obviously you guys are doing a ton more downtown, and it doesn't go without being appreciated. I'm just looking out for somebody that that wouldn't otherwise have a course of action to to appeal if they're thinking that 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 uh, they're they're not being represented correctly, and that's just my concern. Okay, Charlie. <clears throat> Yeah, and Greg, I, I see where you're going with that because, again, ultimately it's our phones that ring if somebody's got an issue. Um, so uh, I, I think for now we are the appeal, if you will. It comes to us, and we've got to turn it over to staff, but that's something we can we need to look at a little bit closer. I want to go back to the banner for just a second. And, again, Kendall, I mm -hmm. appreciate the work that PDP is doing on behalf of the city. I think we get a good deal for what we're spending. Um, but I just have another example to drive the point home about my concerns with some potential banners. I like going to the rodeo dance every year. We know the rodeo dance isn't in downtown. They could, if they wanted to under this program, rent all of the banners in downtown telling everybody in downtown to leave downtown to go to a bar or this rodeo dance. That's, those are the types of things that could happen. And 
uh, that's where my concern lies is, is we've got to find that equilibrium if we're going to offer this program because <coughs> i go every year anyways but then i end up back downtown yeah mayor and council council uh, councilman arnold um there is a limit to how many banners you can have it's never our intention that every single banner be taken by one event and i think that it's probably more likely that we rent 5, 10, yep. 15, you know. But it does state in the policy the maximum would be 50%. And th the remaining 50% would be the banners we've already put up, which are 10 different ones and promoting a number of different things throughout the city. And I, you answered part of my question. I guess coming back to it is, you know, I go back to Whiskey Row because I, it's the easy one for me to go to. If we have a big event off the plaza and somebody wanted to take half of those banners to promote that off the event plaza in competition i just don't see that working well for anybody I, I see that as all of our phones ringing so i think as we're looking at the structure here going forward um, maybe an evaluation of the competition side of providing this service needs to be included and, and then i'll be quiet I'm, I'm intending to second this motion to approve this and go forward but these are my concerns and i really don't want my phone to ring so, <laughs> oh, come on. At least about that. <laughs> well, trust me, mine rings too. <laughs> Jane. Yeah. I think the contract needs to be tightened up before we vote on it. I'd really like to see you work with legal counsel and Don to work out the wording so it's more clear. On, on the banners, is that what you're? On the banners in particular and process. Uh, we're amenable to anything like that. I mean, it, this is a this is an experiment. So, I. I Whatever you think is fair is fine. <laughs> I'm, I'm concerned because the city polls are public property. And correct me if I'm wrong, John, but I think it's a quasi-public forum. We have more than just phone calls to worry about here. Well, it, it does, it, you, you know, opening up the, ban the light polls for banners does create a limited public forum. I think that's why and again, I, I'll just sort of give you my take on some of the comments. I, I don't, when it says organizations eligible for banners in Exhibit A, um, it's a pretty limited. Um, it's a pretty limited list, actually. Even though there are seven or eight bullet points, uh, in my read of the last bullet point, I don't know if this is the intent, but when it says other city events at the discretion of City Prescott. The way I read that is because this, the word city is capitalized. Those are city, those are Prescott events, those are city Prescott events. Yeah. Uh, not just, not events in the city. So, um, you know, the limitations are, I mean, it's a pretty limited list in, in, in a lot of ways. And I think that's kind of the intent of it. But, um, you know, so I don't think, uh, and, I, and I, don't, I don't know if, if this was really a question, but uh, my read of the multi-day events is not that a particular vendor at one of these multi-day events can get ban 90 banners to advertise his corn dog sales on the on right. the court on the courthouse square it's the event itself yeah. not not a, a, an element or a vendor at the event advertising on the banner i don't i don't read it that way i, I think it's the event uh the event itself can get banners but not a particular vendor or, or group of vendors for instance so it's a it's a limited um it's a lim it's a it's a very limiting list it, it um you know it doesn't even really get into the the, the notion of nonprofit versus profit uh if you go down the list you know city of prescott organized events tourism events that receive um bed tax tourism attractions i think that may may could be tightened up because it doesn't necessarily um I mean, it, it has some some examples of museums and performing arts venues, but you know, it doesn't necessarily limit it to nonprofits. So, if there's a tourism attraction, arguably that could be the casino. And and the question is just, what is what does the council want to do? And the more you open it up, the, the the less limited the public forum becomes. So, I think that you know, if there is desire on the council's part to have that tightened up. Um, that's certainly your prerogative, but the other ones, you know, city-owned venues, uh, tournaments sponsored by the city, multi, the multi-day events is limited to only those sponsored by PDP or the chamber, so those are very limited, and the other city events are the are city of Prescott-sponsored 
or City of Prescott organized events. That's the way I read it. So we're talking about, for instance, the, the um, whiskey off-road, I think, would fall under that last bullet point. Maybe, you know, because... Sure, maybe some of the talk. parks and recs events, uh, the great outdoors festival and things like that. So, th so again, those are... So, and if you have, you know, for instance, the one over at, at the lake, well, that's off of downtown, and in theory, that event, the city could advertise downtown sure. if it chose to so I think it's a limited list the only one that maybe needs tightening up is that tourism attraction because that's a fairly broad statement but the other ones are pretty limited okay. it does okay. say in the so. policy however that uh, our banners not to be used for advertising by private for-profit businesses that's it let's go to Steve <clears throat> clarification what language are they going to be written in does there need to be guidelines on language whether it be German, French, Mexican, Spanish, oh, Portuguese, is it, is it should they be only banners in English? Because that is going to come up. Trust me, it will. Whether well, it's Hebrew, uh, I, I mean, I don't care. But I'm just saying we need to make it clear now as a public document that it's only banners using certain types of language. Well. We've run into it, this it, in this it community doesn't, before. I will tell you, it doesn't. This the current list doesn't limit it to that. However, um, if you if you were to limit it to English only, uh, you may have a problem advertising the Oktoberfest. Well, the only thing I'm saying is, is I don't care what's on them. Just be prepared that that's going to be your first negative, and we have to have a way to handle that. And I don't see a way we're going to handle that because nobody's talked about it. So I'm just bringing it up as dialogue within this chamber to understand that that's one of those things out in our culture today <laughs> that is going to be challenged. Um, th you know, there are some specific, it says banners must be produced to size and specs outlined in the application. I think the back back page sort of tells you what the size and specs are, but no, there isn't a limitation on which language these should be in, and I suppose that's up to the 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 uh, advertiser. But the, the entity buying or paying for the banner presumably would have the right to put on there what what you know if it's if it's. But they have to be approved by the PDP. Ultimately, my phone ringing like Charlie. <coughs> so I'm just bringing it up. I understand. To but again, everybody know that that's going right. to be an issue somewhere down the line. I, I don't. I, again, I, I would recommend not limiting it to English because if there's a Cinco de Mayo event, okay. you couldn't advertise it, right? I mean, so I, and I'm not. I'm not trying to be facetious, but those are, you know, limiting it, limiting it to only English is is not only problematic from a legal standpoint, or probably less problematic from a legal standpoint than it is from just a practical standpoint. I'm okay with that. We right. live in America. Right. I'm just stating the fact that we speak English. Let's make sure that we have clarity here because it's going to get challenged. Let me, let me uh, give you what my thoughts are, and then I'll go back to you, Chris. The uh, you know, legislation is being passed every day in Phoenix, and then they decide after they pass it what it really meant. My thinking is that we go ahead and pass this, and uh, Gene and Charlie can sit down with uh, our two folks here and uh, work out the, uh, the details, the, uh, the objections that they may have. And I think that's a simple way, Chris. Uh, Duncan Shane here, Burgermeister. Um, <laughs> I think we are kind of taking a left-hand turn. Um, we're really talking about supporting the PDP and the good work that they do right here with the funding of 20000 out of bed tax, which is uh, uh, the driver of tourism and the receiving of the funds from tourism. It's a good thing to do. If we need to go deeper into uh, the banner program, I think Kendall has shown the interest to indeed do that we could even have a separate uh, item at a future agenda if we want to talk about it but um if if anybody else has no objections i'm ready to make a motion uh we're going to go to the public first All right. okay then you can good afternoon dan my name is daniel matson i live over on merritt street um i was at the meeting last week when uh, the whole idea of these banners was brought up and uh i got the very strong impression that the idea was that the details would be ironed out at a later date or brought back to this place where the public would have an opportunity to have input. Uh, 
the next day I was at a meeting where, of course, it was there was an article in the newspaper about it, and I was at a meeting with <coughs> representatives from quite a few nonprofits, and they were all wondering, well, what's this all about? How's this going to work? They were a little upset at the high price. They're like, well, if they're funding their operations with the price, and I go, well, yeah, they're a nonprofit. It's PDP, not the city, that gets the money from that. But at any rate, there were a lot of questions. There were a lot of concerns as to just who would be able to utilize this. Um, and what John was talking about sounds like it's only going to be city organized events or PDP organized events. What if uh, um, CCJ decided that they wanted to, to advertise an event that's a single day event? Would they be able to? I asked a question on the way out last week, what about Prescott Area Leadership? If they wanted to advertise uh, some event, uh, would they be able to do that? They're not, it's not a city sanctioned event, but it certainly is a nonprofit organization that is beneficial to the city. Um, as far as giving a contract to PDP, uh, I think it's probably a good idea, but I think we should stick with the intent that was put forward in last week's meeting and the details on the uh, uh, banner program should come back to be clarified here by the council and accepted separately by the council. Um, you know, I have no problem with the idea of going forward with letting them know they've got the contract, but I think there's too many details that need to be hashed out on the banner program to just rubber stamp it and not come back to it. So. Um, on the 24th maybe or I don't know what time or place you want to do it but I would say sooner rather than later um, we should keep keep with the intent that was expressed at the last meeting it seemed very clear to me that final approval of the banner program was supposed to take place here in City Council so I would like to suggest that that is adhered to well noted next Good afternoon, Good afternoon, Mayor, Council People. Uh, Kevin Scavel, Merchant Advocate with the Prescott Downtown Merchants Association. Um, got some concerns about the banner program. Seems to me not being um, not being an attorney or a constitutional scholar that limiting um, advertising on our public forum, limited or uh, limited or otherwise. Um, at last week's meeting, we said that religious organizations, which are nonprofits, would not be allowed to advertise their nonprofit events. And I don't think that religious organizations are forbidden from doing that on public property if they aren't displaying a particular religious symbol. Um, why would, say, the walk through Bethlehem? which is already, a banner goes across the city street right now. Why would an organization like that not be allowed to advertise their nonprofit event as opposed to specifically delineated nonprofit organizations who can advertise their for-profit fundraising events, such as the Downtown Partnership and the, the Chamber of Commerce sponsored events. These are fundraisers for these organizations. They may benefit the city, they may benefit portions of the city, they certainly do not benefit other portions of the city. And so I think it's a slippery slope constitutionally when we start limiting what type of nonprofit organizations can advertise, what type of for-profit ventures nonprofit or for-profit organizations can advertise on our publicly paid for, publicly displayed, displayed property. I think it's I think it's a very, very, very tenuous situation, and it's an ACL lawsuit waiting to happen. Secondly, I have objections to this contract with the downtown partnership. The downtown partnership, and I've talked to you all about this. Downtown partnership has several management agreements in this city, and. There are laws that are supposed to be adhered to in, the, in the, the course of the downtown partnership's business, and they routinely disregard laws of this jurisdiction, county specifically, and it seems to me 
that the city should at the very least stipulate that their contractors obey the law. Doesn't that seem to make sense? Because we can argue about what the law says and what's being done. I'll tell you right now, it ain't happening. And so for this city to continue to contract with organizations that, that show blatant disregard for the laws of this county is irresponsible. County requires it, they don't enforce it, but at least their contract says this law needs to be, needs to be adhered to. There's damage being done here. And there maybe there's some good things going on, but there's damage being done too. And I think it's irresponsible for the city to just rubber stamp contracts based on some good things that people do without looking at the total picture. Strong objections to this contract. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Council? Mayor, I'd like to make a motion. Go. I move that we table this item. Oh, I'm sorry. Was there somebody else? Dennis. Oh, I'm sorry. Come on down. Mayor, <clears throat> excuse me, Mayor, Council, on a little lighter note, um, when I envisioned this banner project about five years ago, early 2010, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and started presenting it to different groups in the area. Um, and at that time, there was a different city manager. Um, anyway, the first proposal was suggesting that we um, make the residents and our tourists, visitors, more aware of Prescott's assets. And those would be our major events, the museums, the parks, the trails, rodeo, so forth. Um, anyway, it's taken a long time coming, but uh, I want to thank you know, those in the city, and um, actually 2013, we were able to get the uh, Chamber of Commerce Executive Committee, the Downtown Partnership Executive Committee, and the uh, um, City Council and Mayor to write endorsements on this proposal at the time. And um, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Dennis Gallagher, president of the Prescott Western Heritage Foundation. And um, anyway, since we were able to get those endorsements, things have started progressing. Obviously, we had to get a written policy in place. So I appreciate those that have been involved with that. And uh, so anyway, um, that's about it, but I think you know, the questions concerning events and things that have come up since then, you know, that's for you to sort out. But I think the, um, the banners that are up now really serve a purpose, and I think the community as a whole appreciates them, and I think visitors will appreciate them. And um, anyway, I appreciate what you've done. Thank you. Thanks, Dennis. Anyone else? Mayor, I'd like to move to table this item to uh, a future date, possibly March 24th, so that uh, more the, the contract can be better defined, so we know what we're voting on. Okay, in order to do that, we're going to need somebody to work with the committee that has been working on this. Uh, you're volunteering? I'll okay. volunteer, but Charlie. we need legal counsel as well. If Ma that's your pleasure, Mayor. Okay. Uh, Mayor, I'd like to ask legal. Can we somehow approve the contract without the banner program included in that to move forward with that, and then at a later time we could have a whole separate item to discuss the banner program? You could. I mean, in, in And I don't know if that would theory. satisfy the rest of the, the council or not, yeah. but... Uh, 
I'd like to, um, Gene, I mean, what do you think of, on that? Is that the holdup on the contract, or is that? My, my question of that, Chris, is uh, it, it seems the banner program is a part of the management of the downtown that the DPA is doing, a, a, I think, a great job on. Uh, I think it's a matter of cleaning it up, uh, if that's what it takes. And uh, so uh, do we have a, uh, Jean's motion is that we table this until the 24th. And she's agreed, Charlie's agreed, and you've agreed second. to uh, to work on this. So now we have a second. Uh, let's vote on it. Chris, you voted Chris. twice. I didn't mean to. Okay. Passes six to one. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Kukneo dissenting. Okay. <laughs> Item E. <coughs> Item 2E, adoption of resolution this. number 4280-1489, okay. establishing an Art and Public Places Committee. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, the item before you today is uh, the continuation of discussion that started on February 24th, 2015, uh, when the City Council approved uh, new guidelines for the acceptance of public art as part of those guidelines. Um, oversight through an advisory committee that's before you today um, is, is contemplated. Um, the Art and Public Places Committee that's before you as a resolution for establishment um, would review and provide input on proposed donations and public art projects, operating impacts, maintenance, location, and appropriateness of public art to be included in the public art collection. Um, within the resolution, which um, is authorized by City Code Chapter 1-13, which discusses standing committees of the City Council, it would consist of five members to be appointed by the City Council for two-year non-staggered terms. Um, and um, in discussing this with Cindy Gresser, who's been uh, really essential in moving all of this forward, um, she had recommended representation uh, from the following groups. A Prescott Museum professional, local gallery owner, arts educator or artist who has completed public art projects, Prescott Area Arts and Humanities Council representative, a community member with background in history or historic preservation and or interest in uh, or a degree in art. So those would just be guidelines. It, it, it's to try to assure that there's a broad representation on the committee, um, but obviously any um, applicants would go through the uh, council appointment committee and then come forward to the full council for <laughs> approval. And um, Cindy Gresser is here if you have any questions for her, um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Charlie? Mayor Pro Tem, thank you. And again, Cindy, thank you for your work on this. Um, my only comment is on the fifth representative position. Um, I do think having a community member is extremely important. I think a sub note to that is somebody who has a background is great, but I don't think that that should be a limiting factor. Uh, I think somebody at, from the community at large should be a representative on the committee. I think that's important. Uh, thank you, and I just would point out that um, as it's listed in Section 6 of the resolution, it's referred to as preferred membership, so I think that is completely up to the Council's uh, prerogative and the appointment committee. And, and I also think that, that the little Roman numeral 5 talks about community member with and, it used and or interest, so I think that's broad enough to pretty much cover everybody who's interested. Perfect. I just want to make sure the record reflects the intent that that position is very broad in its scope. Thank you. Mayor, we're up to Steve. Go ahead. Just keep going. <laughs> okay. Sandy, thank you. And as always, I'm one that likes to hammer on the maintenance issues. So the financial impact to this item <clears throat> somewhat bothers me that it's written so loosely. It says uh, the acceptance of public art should involve minimal. Well, minimal is a very difficult word for me to swallow. I think it should say no financial impact to the city. Number one. Let me finish. Since the policy anticipates, and I think it should say, since the policy requires that the donors would also contribute the cost of installation and provide for the review of the process in anticipation that there will be a long-term maintenance cost would be bared by the presenter, uh, the personnel and material costs for support of public art and places the committee will likewise be negligible and that's another word I don't like is negligible negligible because you can you can put any kind of spin you want to on those what I'm trying to do is protect this community from having a financial impact to any public art that's donated to them if it's important enough for somebody to donate the art it's important enough for them to maintain it 
Councilman Blair, if I could answer that question for you. Um, the financial impact in the council memo is not the enact is not the specific wording of the guidelines for acceptance of public <laughs> art. There is a whole section that relates to maintenance and installation, and it does specify that that would be required of the artist. But I wrote this in a broad manner because there could be an instance where the advisory committee would come forward and recommend something to council and based on their, their review of it, it would also show what the costs and, and maintenance are and the council may still wish to accept that. However, every committee that the council creates has a negligible cost related to it. There's staff time, there's some printing. It's not a significant cost. We don't need to create a department for it. Um, but there, there are minor costs um, even with printing the council packet. So, so there are some negligible meaning. I don't think you need to have a budget that's more than you know a small thousand dollar supply budget to to support a committee. I'm okay with that. And this, the committee's great if this is all just tied to the committee. Mm -hmm. But when it comes right down to the art, I think it needs to be clear cut that this community does not have the funds to maintain public art. Period. And I think that's pretty clear in the guidelines that what we are looking to that one of the considerations of many considerations is not only location but ongoing maintenance and and agreement with okay. the exception of with the acceptance of that art if the council were to approve a piece of art that outlines what the responsibilities are and and that would all be very clear going in where do i find that language that was in the guidelines for acceptance guidelines. of public okay. art that was approved at the I, last okay. i just want to make sure it's there just, mm -hmm. like i say I, i'm excited for this this whole policy mm -hmm but I think it just needs to be very clear. Thank you. And just a reminder, the policy that was adopted, I think, at the last meeting, ultimately the, the acceptance of the art comes to the council. Correct. So you can reject it, accept it, accept it with conditions. You know, it, it, is, it is ultimately <coughs> this, the council's call to accept art or reject it or impose certain conditions. It's Chris. Yeah, Mayor, thank you. This is a long time coming. Thank you so much, Cindy, for working through this and uh, listening to us talk about things. I think art's very important to this community. I mean, we are just loaded with it. And I think sometimes the problem is there's so much around us that we don't even realize it's there. I was sitting at the uh, Arizona room at the Hacienda today, and, you know, there's the stained glass, and there's the murals going down the side of the walls. Um, just look at this place. Public art right here. Look at the top of that thing. Public art all over the place. You know, this stuff doesn't take maintenance, but I think Steve's point is a good one. And I think that's what this policy establishes, that if we see something that could be a problem, we can address it already before it becomes a next controversy, before we start taking up sides on this issue and uh, you know, before the next mural, before the next bench, whatever comes our way, this is a great step moving forward. And I think see this as a livable, breathable thing that's gonna evolve over time and we're gonna have to refine it. And uh, I just thank you for coming up with it. It's been a long time coming. Allison, we have some public art already around town, uh, notably the lovely bronze statue in front of City Hall. Who maintains that? Um, I don't think there's an exceptional amount of maintenance to that. Um, however, the base of that would be something that if we saw a structural issue right now, we would probably send out either streets or um, recreation services, depending on you know what the nature of the issue is, to look at it and maintain it. But we haven't had a policy in the past that deals with acceptance of public art and so one of the things I th that at least you know in my professional opinion having worked in places that have committees like this that could come out of this is that you would have a donation agreement that stipulates what the responsibilities are for the ongoing maintenance of the art w when you accept something within the policy I think it really just establishes two things uh, a procedure to inventory all of this art that we have in this in the city and then second, to set up the processes to address issues like Councilman Blair's and like you are also uh, uh, requesting. The last installation of public art here on city property that I recall was the pavers for the um, uh, Centennial. And so at that time, I believe we had to move benches and do some stuff like that. And yeah, that, that fell on the city, but it was a negligible cost and it was to install those pavers for the Centennial recognition. So whatever whatever we can do when public art comes forward to create a a fund for maintenance i think is important when you start talking about fran wildman's uh timeline in front of the library sure. that gets constant abuse and mm -hmm. needs to be maintained there's not funds to do that unless you go out to the public and ask for donations a lot of times those are shortcomings especially in financial times so mm -hmm. if there's a revolving fund set up for maintenance through 
public trust of arts, it would be a very beneficial thing to do. I agree. Cindy, question. Uh, there's an ad hoc group uh, been working for a year and a half now, and they'll continue for some time in the future, but ultimately they will be some type of a monument, uh, probably down on the courthouse square that the supervisors have already committed to uh, for the placement. Uh, would that be? Would that fall under? If what it's we're on, about? yeah. If it's on the courthouse square, that's okay. Yavapai County property, and so no, we would actually have no guidance over that process. Okay. Question. Anyone else? Yeah. Public. It's a beautiful thing. Okay. How about making the motion? Uh, Move to adopt resolution number four two eight zero dash one four eight nine. Second. second. Motion made and seconded. Vote please. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Thanks, Cindy. Uh, G? Item 2F. No, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Special events, policies, and procedures update. Afternoon, Mayor Council. Joe, you're limited to an hour and a half. Okay, I can do it. I can, I can do it a lot quicker than that, actually. Um, following the theme of the day, we'll do some more special events. How's that sound? Uh, real quickly, I'm just going to do a little background and talk about some of the adjustments that we've made over the last year or so, and then finally get to the discussion points at the very end of it. So it'll be real quick. Okay, a little background. Uh, special events are an important source of sales tax generation for the city. Uh, these special events are held at various <coughs> venues throughout the city, not just downtown. You know, as an example, Watson Lake, Willow Lake, a lot of other places, the rodeo grounds, uh, whatnot. Uh, we're also unique among many cities because we have the downtown, the courthouse plaza and the history of downtown. So a lot of folks want to put on their special event in the downtown area because of that history and the ambiance. Uh, and just in 2011, which is the most recent available data, the visitors spent $119 million in the city, uh, generating $7.8 million in state and local tax revenue. Uh, the one event alone, the Whiskey Off-Road, had an economic impact that was presented to you guys, I think, last year sometime that had over $4 million of economic impact. Uh, also, due in large part to special events, the transient occupancy tax collection has increased 40% over the last four years. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, this just, uh, I won't go through every bullet point on here, but I just want to point out that we do have a, a very well-established permitting process for these special events. It's not just a matter of somebody coming down and filling out one sheet that says we want to have an event and we say go ahead and do it. There's a process that we go through and it starts uh, with a criteria letter that's sent out in October to folks that have had events in the past and anybody that might be having an event to ask for their, their date for the following year. They have till the end of December to, to turn that in. At the end of December we sit down with the PDP and the others and coordinate those schedules so we don't end up with uh, a bunch of events happening all on the same day. We try to try to limit that and try to make sure that the events, if they are on the same day, can work together. Mm -hmm. uh, the Recreation Services then combines that event with the Downtown Partnership as well as our sporting events so that we don't have a big sporting event that might cannibalize some event that's going on downtown. So we try to have some foresight in that. Uh, if there are conflicts, we sit down with the groups and try to negotiate a mutually agreed compromise. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, the event organizer, organizers are required to complete a detailed special <laughs> event application. And then the final step, uh, which is that they go to the special events committee, which is representatives from all of the impacted departments in the city of Prescott, uh, streets, fire, police, uh, recreation services, uh, sanitation, the list goes on, uh, tax and license, uh, Yavapai County and PDP for comments. Uh, we get uh, the site maps uh, for street closures and coordinate all that and then uh, that committee makes a uh, uh, either approves or denies that permit. Okay, through this last process of, of a year or maybe a little bit more, we've reached out to the community to try to get as much uh, input as we could from business owners downtown and anybody who's affected by the special events and this is just a list of some of those meetings. Uh, the big one on there, I think, is we, we had an open house or a public forum at the Gray Sparks Activity Center, invited a lot of business owners, and I think, quite frankly, through this process of meeting with the stakeholders, we've really gotten some good input, some good feedback that I think we've put into motion, and I'll go into that on the next slide. <coughs> I just also want to mention that we have had several meetings or discussions 
uh, with the school district about the possible use of Mile High Middle School, uh, the football field for some events that are currently being, being held on streets. That footprint will allow for the events to grow a little bit larger and maybe free up some congestion from street closures that we currently have. So that's ongoing. Uh, it looks like we may be making a presentation to the um, school board in uh, April. Okay, these are the changes that we've made in the last year or so based on that input from the stakeholders and the meetings that we've had. Uh, we've, we've added a special events web page with standardized site plans and more detailed advanced information for the public. Now there's two phases to that. The first phase is already in motion and that's you go to the city's website, go to recreation services and special events and we've detailed that a little bit better so it's easier to find street closures, it's easier to find out when the events are going to be held and what they look like. The next step uh, will happen, in fact I've got a meeting tomorrow with uh, IT to get that to evolve into its own tab so that you'll click on special events and everything will be right there. The street closures, uh, the site maps, and all the, all the pertinent information that if you're a member of the public or a retailer downtown that wants to know what the timeline on the event is and what's going on, you'll be able to find it there. Um, as you know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, a, a Bollard program for safety improvements down on Whiskey Row was presented to council and is in action. Uh, this fourth bullet point here, the event boss was discussed before and I think the approach that we'd like to take on this is rather than try to fund a position or a part of a position to do that, uh, we tried last year uh, during the Oktoberfest when it was really busy downtown as a trial run to have an event boss there. Unfortunately, if you remember, it rained really hard and uh, it rained, rained all the events out. So we got about part of the way through it. But what I think we're going to do on this event, what we're going to do on this, on this particular topic is our department, Recreation Services, will take uh, the lead on that and do a few times this year, myself included. We'll go down, serve as the event boss, basically going through a checklist to make sure that the event promoters are doing what they're supposed to be doing and uh, do, filing a little report on that. So we'll see how that works out and how needed it is, but we will put that into play this year. Uh, Joe, just yes. curiosity, mm -hmm. the Whiskey Row Marathon would be one that I think is crucial to have an event boss at. Um, I don't know if you're planning on doing every event, but that's one that I think we need to have someone at. Thank you, Councilman Arnold. That is one of the bigger ones, and that is one that uh, we would like to take a look at. Uh, we've uh, reviewed our and revised our business signature forms. We looked all over the country to see what other communities were doing. About half of them don't do anything uh, as far as signatures with the adjoining businesses. Uh, but I think ours at this point in time is about as good as it gets. We require 75% of the business owners uh, affected by the street closure to sign off on it. it has to be an owner or a manager and we have them go hand go hand, hand deliver that to get the signatures as well as have the site map with them and the details of the event when they do that. Uh, we created a progress checklist for the applicants to make sure that they knew step by step what was required of them and so they could track their progress. Uh, handicap drop-off was one of the things that came up through our public forum and we'll address that through site plan review. It isn't always uh, that easy to do. Uh, if we bump in the street closures, we technically end up in a lot of cases in a crosswalk, but we'll look at those as site plans come in and try to, try to provide that uh, as much as possible. Uh, the timeline to open the street is something that the, the event boss will take on on a real-time basis as well as it'll be addressed also in site plan review. And that means if, you're, if your street closure says you're gonna pull up the barricades at two o'clock, they better be pulled up at two o'clock. And uh, we'll follow up on that and make sure that that happens. We wanna think forward a little bit more. We wanna create a two-year calendar. Most of these events are, are events that are being held year after year. I think Bluegrass is on 34 or something like that. So these events come back year after year. There's no reason we can't plan a couple years out and have you know, a pretty good idea of what's gonna be happening downtown. We went through and revised our special event policy and procedure manual uh, to you know, get that cleared up and make that as easy to work with as we could, but cover everything that needed to be covered. Um, now as the, uh, a part of the uh, liquor license application, uh, the event promoter uh, will have to file a copy of his contract with the nonprofit uh, to the city clerk, just as they do now for the state. 
So those are the things that we've done over this last year or so. And this last slide uh, really is just the, the uh, discussion points uh, for you today. So there's, there's three things uh, to talk about today. And the first one is we will have to adjust the timeline uh, for special event uh, and liquor license applications to allow for council approval. Uh, right now in the uh, city code, I believe it's 45 days prior to the event, you need to file the application. Uh, we need to move that to 90 days because, again, it'll have to go to city council for a city council vote. So we're just extending that timeline based on that uh, criteria. So that's the first thing. The second thing is uh, a potential for your discussion, uh, event time frames or curfews for events on downtown streets. Uh, do we, so I think the latest one we have going right now uh, goes till 11 o'clock. Uh, I think there's some desire from the downtown business owners to maybe take a look at that and see if there's an adjustment that could be made to that. Maybe that's 7 o'clock, maybe it's 8 o'clock, maybe it's 9 o'clock. Uh, that's for discussion today. And the last one is just uh, the event application appeal process. Currently, as it's written, if your the special events committee denies the special event application, they have uh, the right to file an appeal with the city manager within five days, and the city manager rules on that within 10 days. Uh, we, would, we would like that appeal process to add in the ability for the city manager at his discretion to bring that to council uh, to look at that appeal. So with that, I'll uh, turn that back over to you and answer any questions that you have uh, about those discussion items. Thank you, Mary. Great. Joe, thanks for, for you and your team that's come up with this. I know it's been a long and arduous process and uh, with a lot of feedback and, and you've listened. I think for the most part and came to, to us with a good plan here. Uh, I just got a couple questions on, um, and maybe this would go to uh, the manager legal. On this uh, permitting special events uh, where we require street closures, trash receptacles, police, medical coverage, et cetera. Where does that, I imagine that's overtime. Is, is that correct? For like streets or co uh, police or fire? <coughs> Well, there is, we, we haven't tapped into any overtime events, but that's all on the private uh, event promoter. So what happens is they'll go through the process and say they propose three porta johns and we know that based on the attendance that they're projecting, they're going to need 20. <laughs> At the special events committee meeting, we'll say you need to contract with whoever they're contracting with, but you need to have 20 of them. Uh, so the, those are not city services provided. But, but trash receptacles and like the street now we're going to have the, the the bollards and stuff on uh, so make it a little easier but we're also we these normally require extra police and i'm not trying to put you on the spot joe i guess what i'm saying is since this is kind of a tourism driven thing wouldn't that overtime come from the red tax or something like that and, and part of it does so i can give you an example when i did my concert at pioneer park we paid for all the city services trash police we paid direct we paid the city etc um, but I know there are some events where part of the tourism process, we might comp that, but we account for it in the bed tax allocation. Okay. And Councilman Lazell, if I could just clarify, none of these costs are coming from the city. Any, any kind of security presence that the event requires is at their expense. Any kind of trash collection is at their expense. None of these are uh, city-provided facilities or city-provided uh, services. Okay. Thank you. Well, and I would just also add that wasn't in the list there, but we also require that the event promoter obtain insurance, naming the city. In fact, through the risk pool they can get, they can literally go online and get event insurance when they use a public facility, public property like a street. So they are required to also get insurance at their own cost and name the city as a, an, an insured. Okay, Charlie. Mayor, thank you. Joe, on your second to last slide, um, you state we require a copy of the contract between the promoter and the nonprofit for the liquor license application. One of the reasons that the liquor license is set up the way that it is is so that the nonprofit would receive 25% of the gross revenue. Um, it has come up numerous times. Does the city have the ability to verify that when we do a wrap up of an event? How is that verified? And so whose responsibility is it? Is it the city's? Is it the state's? 
Councilman Arnold, that, that is a contract between the nonprofit and the event promoter. So the city has no oversight over that. Just as a part of the liquor application, as the state requires, uh, that a copy of that contract be provided with that. But we have no oversight. That's a contract between two, two consenting entities. So I think one thing that, as we're talking about this and for discussion purposes, um, you know, ultimately, a, a contract between a party is important and valuable. You have nonprofits that don't do this every day. I, I think I can address that partially. Um, as you know, <clears throat> unlike other liquor licenses, special event liquor licenses are essentially approved by the city council. Um, but the license is still issued by the state. So in other words, it's not a just recommendation. It is that the state takes that and issues the license. The state does have, if there is a legitimate complaint, the state as a licensing authority can audit those books to determine whether or not the event organizer and the nonprofit, you know, is actually paying the nonprofit that minimum required statutory amount per, this, per the contract. The, the reason we get the contract is, is because it has to say in it that there's a certain percentage of the revenues go to the nonprofit. The state, the city doesn't have the authority to audit that, but the liquor department does if there's a legitimate complaint. So that answers part of the question. I, I think that hopefully will clarify some concerns in the past that have been raised that it's the state that's responsible for auditing that aspect. Um, there was a follow-up point I was going to make, but I will wait because I can't remember what it was. Chris. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I've watched a lot of this uh, come around. I'm the liaison for Special Events Committee, and I show up to his meetings. Um, I think all these changes that you've come up with are great steps forward, but some really stick out to me. I think the event boss, is it was hugely needed for a long time. So when uh, a street is closed, the event's over, the street doesn't stay closed for two hours with all the parking missing or three hours or whatever it may be. There's someone actually there from the city that is coordinating with a specific person from the event that can call the shots and we can open the streets back up or do whatever. So that's a great step forward. The one thing I, I'd like to see change even in the future is the um, business signature forms. Uh, I mean, that's like so 1974 to uh, have the sheet and walk around and try and get in every business, have people sign off on it. One of the things that I know that you guys have problems with is actually getting a person in charge of that business. I mean, you might have to go back multiple, multiple times to try and find the owner or the decision maker that will sign off on this. I'd like to see some kind of email list where this could be sent out and people could reply uh, electronically and if you don't uh, show opposition or you choose not to respond to that it, it would show as you're not objecting to that event so that's that's the only thing I'd like to see changed but um, you guys are making huge strides and making the <coughs> events better downtown and everything on this list is a jump forward you're back I remembered TPT sales tax um, how are we structuring that with special events Uh, we uh, we sit on the special events committee. We have a representative from tax who who works with the vendors or the promoters to get whatever licensing is needed done. And so it could vary depending on what type of a, an event, if it's a base fee or if they're actually going to report um, sales. Absolutely, if it's a nonprofit, as we've talked about before, a nonprofit show or event, uh, there's a twenty-five dollar per booth um, fee. If it's a for-profit event, there's transient uh, merchant um, fees <coughs> and permits and are needed as well as reporting. And so every event that happens in the city that's a special event, usually on public property or under some of these guidelines, big events on private property, tax department has input and gives direction to what type of tax we need to collect. Right, through the committee when they come to Great. present their event. Thank you. Jim. Thank you. Okay. You need to get back up there. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, I like the idea of an event boss, but I don't think it's righteous to have people come here, here from all over the planet be in competition with the folks that are here every day, paying the property tax every day for the opportunity to serve the citizens of Prescott and anybody else that come in town and not follow the same rules. Not only, not only do they need to have a transaction privilege license to collect tax, they need to collect the tax. 
And again, if they are a for-profit event, uh, they are required to get a transaction privilege license as well as a transient merchant license, which has deposits which they file with us that they cannot get back until they do file the transaction privilege tax. So we don't have the $25 in lieu of fee? For non-profit events, yes, there is a $25 in lieu fee, but for for-profit events, there is the other requirements. Okay, then my qu my next question would come, you know, a lot of people hide under an umbrella of nonprofit, and their CEOs get a tremendous amount of dollars and then get to write it off on top of it. So we're being taxed two and three times, which is, again, not an equal playing field for people that are in business in downtown or any place else in this city that are now somewhat in competition with the city. I'm just sharing my thought process, and Joe, I hope you're listening because that's something on my mind. Mayor, Mayor if I could add to Jim, wouldn't a promoter be for profit? He's being hired, or they are being hired f to promote something. In that case, but sometimes the event promoters are nonprofits. Uh, well, Mark, question: uh, the um, how's that going to work with the state taking over? Uh, the collection uh, is, is there something in the TPT or the state rules or something that on these type of events the state could re could or the city could retain? We will re we retain local licensing of businesses related to a business license if we had one, but as far as the trans uh, transient merchant and, and um, trans. Um, we do maintain the transient merchant license. That's not part of the model city tax code. That's a separate section of the code. Okay. Question. Shouldn't that, Joe, be part of the event boss's drive to make sure that the paperwork has been filled out with Mark Woodfield's office, that they are indeed paying either the in lieu of tax or the, the, the transient tax? Because it seems to me that a lot of times people come in and say, look, Look how much we made, and they're gone, and we don't get anything. Uh, thank you, Councilman. And in, a, in the case of the nonprofit show where we have the $25 per event participant that is collected by the show organizers with the list and then given to trans, um, tax and license, when it's a for profit event, the transient merchant license are individual, they're quite expensive. There's photo IDs that the transient merchants have to carry. Um, when they're selling. Question. Example, whiskey off-road. For profit. Yes. Do they fill out all their paperwork and are you in receipt of that? Yes, we work with them to make sure they get all their paperwork in. Thank you very much. Okay. Public? Come on down. Good Anybody afternoon, know? sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Jimmy Savwini. I own Brick and Bones Bistro down on uh, Montezuma. And I've been have, uh, asked to speak on behalf of several of the uh, downtown restaurants and bars to this subject. And Council, Councilman Lamerson kind of gave us a good segue into kind of what our main concerns are. And the first thing I would like to say is that uh, the group that we've worked with only want to be good partners in this whole situation. I mean, there's, there's an impact with all of these public events uh, to the downtown traffic, to the business that happens. However, we do recognize what a great asset to the community that these events are. Uh, it's, it's part of what defines Prescott as everybody's hometown and brings people here, brings the locals out, and we very much look forward to those. I would like to thank Joe and his uh, department for working with us for about the last six to eight months. We've been talking about different things that that are our concerns and you know we could go on for quite a long time with the different things that we feel are important to be addressed but I'll keep them concise because I think that's where and, and wh where he's laid out and we've been over a lot of these things I think as you guys have voiced is a step in the right direction I think uh, you know we're looking for structure and some accountability to these events um, within keeping in mind what our perspective is and I think the main thing that if there's a change that we could structure, which has already been talked about, it would be a time limit to these events. Um, 
for me as a restaurant owner, 7 o'clock is, is a good time for me because we get dinner traffic after that. It gives us a couple of hours to serve food before the nighttime stuff kicks in. And so, you know, but and for the bar owners, it's a little later. Given the fact that we have an earning window that, that exists from about 8 to 2 a.m., and that's important for us to get, you know, some residual people to come to our places to, and to stay in the downtown area to spend money and generate tax revenues and everything else. That's important to everybody. So that's probably the main one that we're concerned that, that we could maybe make a change or, or just to find. I don't know that there's ever been a definition of what constitutes these type of events. I realize there's some, the street dance, some other ones that have some extenuating circumstances. The group that, that I represent, which is, you know, Palace, <coughs> Whiskey Row Pub, uh, Tommy upstairs at Jersey Lills, are all open to being very flexible as far as these extenuating events and making sure that, you know, we don't shut a street dance down or a, an event down at 7 o'clock when that's not realistic for that. Um, the other thing is, too, that the reasoning for around the 8 o'clock time frame is us as liquor license holders, we have a responsibility to see what, you know, if we have 5,000 people out on the square, two, 3,000, they filter into our establishments and they've been out there drinking all day. We have a responsibility. We do anyway, but, you know, if we've got beer vendors out there concentrated and we're served, they're serving alcohol, we have to assess the level of intoxication or the abilities for us to do our business. And the later that goes on, the harder it is for us, I think, to accurately be able to do that. And obviously, if we can't do that, it costs us in revenues as well. It's not all revenue driven. It's, it's, it's a public concern and it's our liability as well. So I really believe that, that these guys are putting together a very comprehensive, structured approach. And I think it's, I think it's something that's been needed for quite a long time. So, um, but that's our main concern is that everybody work together and that we come up with something that everybody's happy with that can continue to, you know, our summer earning period is, is critical to our survival down there. So we need that revenue. Uh, we want to see these events grow. And so we, we just want a, a responsible approach. And I think they're on the right path as far as that goes. So any questions? Of I, do. I thought about my lights on there first. What's your number? <laughs> I thought about this a lot, and I'll just throw out a suggestion. All events in the downtown core, 7 o'clock, except for street dances in 11 o'clock, and gives a window to the operators downtown for their food on normal events and uh, on street dances. It gives them a three-hour window to make money off the booze events. So if we can think about something, and in the wintertime it fluctuates, and people don't want to be standing around outside when it's cold anyhow. So at 5 o'clock, all of a sudden, people start moseying out and we turn the event down they can go over and have meals earlier and in the summer when it gets dark at 6 30 7 o'clock the same thing happens so i think some of those things could be thought about in a realistic time frame that makes sense to a lot of folks and what was your time frame seven for all or excuse me seven for all afternoon events regular events like uh, the whiskey off road for an example unless it's street down the street dance night then it's 11 o'clock shut down and the neighbors that live above that complain constantly about the noise the street dance is shut down at 11 gives the bar owners and and the restaurants from 11 to 2 to have an opportunity to raise funds well and we and we can plan for those kind of situations steve and to your point the beer fest that these guys put on in october i think it was uh on goodwin street they closed at 7 p.m and it, it was packed that was a great event i know a lot of people from our place and, and from a lot of the other ones interacted with that event they did a great job and everybody I talked to in the downtown area that has a bar and a restaurant experienced a great influx of, of business all the way into that was a great day for us and that's a perfect example of how these things can work together I, I really believe they can yeah, I remember Oktoberfest, uh, God helped you out, opened up a bucket of water over the city, and well, I saw coolers going down the street. Well, you know? and I mean, and didn't help us out. I, I Again, I, I don't I, I don't wish for that no, to happen I, I get at that. all. And, and again, that's, and not to, I know what you're saying, but uh, I think in the past there's been a bit of an adversarial approach between the downtown businesses, specifically bars and restaurants, and maybe some of these events. Maybe adversarial is a little bit tough of a word, but you know everybody's competing for the revenue, and everybody it, we all benefit from the inf so it's from the influx of people. So it's just how do we bring all this together so everybody can can do 
better. And we got to watch, I think, collateral damage on this one because I think if we establish these rules, everyone almost has to play by the same one or it, or it doesn't work out. You know, the rodeo lets out about 8 o'clock. You know, we say, okay, events end at 9 o'clock in, in Prescott. Well, do they have to close their street dance down at 9 o'clock so they get that half hour window? No one's going to attend the thing. So we got to watch then out for that. Then they do. No, I'm just and, no, and you know, it's not downtown. It's over there, but but still, they, they're just because it's not downtown doesn't mean they're not competing with the Windsock Bar or restaurants that are over in that area. So we got to be very careful of that. And then you know, we have to watch out for the boot drop. You know, that's an event downtown that it's there, so we can go to midnight and shoot off fireworks and all get happy and crazy. But are we going to shut that special event down, even though they don't serve liquor? We just got to be very careful when we set these rules, what events we're going to be hammering, because if we start making exceptions, then the rule has no weight anyway. Well, and I think that's what that's why the council can have some latitude when you approach these kind of things. I mean, I think you have to approach each event as, as an individual autonomous event. And, and again, there are extenuating circumstances that are going to say hey you know yeah the boot drop you don't shut that at seven o'clock i mean that's right. the street dance and so I, it, again it's going to take a little active management it's going to take a little bit of structure and so i think it's important that that everyone gets taken into account i mean they're all different in in what they do and how they how they operate so. and i think something that's really going to help out too is if uh negotiations with the school go good and we can start using that junior high ball field because then people could park in the parking garage right there and never even have to go on Montezuma Street. They could walk right to the junior high, do their event, you know, then go back and it wouldn't affect the parking down there or the crowds wouldn't be down there too. Sure, absolutely. Great. Jimmy, um, I, I think we're on the right track, would you not say? Uh, definitely. I mean, so when we started this process eight or right. ten months ago, and, and I've met with a lot of you guys, talked with you, everybody, there, there was, they had a forum and there was some structure there, but it really wasn't defined. And we very much appreciate a seat at the table and the, and the input that you've allowed us to have because we think we have some valuable things to say about it. And I think we've made great strides, and I think everybody would agree that we're headed in the right direction for sure as far as you know it's about structure and it's about accountability the accountability for us i mean really the the kicker is the alcohol and and serving of and and us having to run interference on people that just came off the street and i think joe and, and his department with a with an event boss and those kind of ideas are going to be able to you know people over serving out of these beer trucks and and some of the things that are happening that they need to be that liquor license even though it's a special event they are subject to the same laws rules regulations that we are as liquor license owners in establishments and that is over serving over serving and, and assessing how much an individual's had to drink and right. and how you do all that because we have that liability so do they and we need to make sure that that's not going on ramping out in the street and i think we're on the right path to to, to taking care of those kind of things so sure. having said that Joe, you know all the big events that go on that's a regular mainstay. I don't think we need to grind this down to the minute and where we're, we paint ourselves in a corner so we can get these the boot drop and the, the dances and kind of and, and not just a one size fits all 11 o'clock or 6 o'clock. We can kind of come up with some parameters that I think everybody's can be uh, receiving on. Correct? I... Correct. Okay. And one more quick point to Councilman Arnold talking about the 25% and the state's oversight, which I believe that is correct. They would have the oversight. I also believe it's incumbent on the charitable organization that has formed a contract with the promoter to understand what their rights are under the law. And, and you know, just because 25%, I know some of these promoters around have said they would donate 35, 40, 45%. And so they do have some accountability as far as making sure that the money that was gathered and, you know, so there, we, we've talked about this a lot because there's a lot of this that, and everybody knows there's, you know, these events generate a considerable amount of revenue and people want to know where the money's going. So I think that it's incumbent on the charitable organizations to have 
you know, it's their money that's being generated here, and they need to know what their rights are under the law, and they need to know also, you know, d d the parameters of how the event's going to be conducted. If there's gate money as opposed to, you know, liquor sales, as opposed to wh how much are they getting, and that needs to be clearly defined. Sounds like these guys are maybe on the, I, I think they've really kind of comprehensively yeah. tried to cover everything here, so, you know, but they have a stake in it. It's their money ultimately, and it's why under the auspices of a charity that these events are taking place. Not all, but the charitable ones, so. Well, Jim, thank you. Thank you very Appreciate much. It. Appreciate your Jim. time. You know, his pretzel bites are wicked awesome, too. <laughs> we can tell by looking at you. Thank you. Could I take a minute also? Jim, you did a great job. Thank you. Joe, thanks for all your hard work. Sorry about my voice. I just want to mention a couple things. I want to, what Chris had mentioned about the, with the uh, rodeo street dance, or the rodeo dance, that's on private property. It has nothing to do with city streets. Um, also, I am not opposed to things on the streets. I'd rather stay on the streets than go to the, to the middle school personally, as long as there's, you know, parameters. Um, to Steve's comment about the liquor and the dances going later, I, and we don't have a problem with the event going to 11 o'clock, but the, the liquor needs to stop at 8 o'clock. If they want to continue the event, that's, we don't have an issue with that, but we feel the liquor should stop at 8 o'clock. So that might be a nice compromise. Um, but we appreciate uh, everyone's time on this. I know you've all given a lot of thought. Joe's been fabulous. Uh, Chris and Greg have been involved a lot too, and I've talked to Charlie a few times. So it's greatly appreciated. We, we feel good that we're, make, we're making progress on this. And I, for one, I love the street events as long as there's parameters. And just for an example that was used as far as the uh, marathon, you know, if they're having a really fast race and, every, and they've, got a, they've got the thing going to 3 o'clock, but everyone who finishes in two and a half hours, they need to close it down sooner than 3 o'clock just because it's done. Yeah. So that would be my only point. But thank you very much. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Beautiful. Matt, you're awful quiet. Okay. Okay, that was uh, information only. And, uh, Joe, I think you get the direction that... Uh, that the public has asked then. Okay. Mayor, will that be coming back to us later this month? Uh, is there any council action or are we good with our current direction? Councilman Arnold, yeah, there's, uh, there will be some code changes, changes coming back. Uh, the one that pertains to the length of time for the liquor application as well as a code amendment for the uh, appeal process. Great. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Item 2G, award of four unit price multi-year contracts for aggregate and, assault and asphalt concrete materials to Arrowhead, one Arrowhead Mining and Materials in an amount not to exceed $100,000, city contract number 2015-111, to Asphalt Paving and Supply Inc Incorporated in an amount not to exceed $800,000, city contract number 2015-112, three CMIX in an amount not to exceed $800,000, city contract number 2015-113, and four, Material Delivery Incorporated doing business as MDI Rock in an amount not to exceed $75,000. City contract number 2015-114. Thank you, Dana. Good, Good afternoon, afternoon, Mayor Joel. Council. We should have put Joe's on last and at least would have kept an audience. <laughs> <laughs> well, he had an hour and a half, so I'm assuming I have somewhat along the okay. same amount of time. <laughs> yeah, that's what it means. <laughs> The Streets and Utility Division require a wide range of materials to uh, maintain our infrastructure. Uh, these materials, as they're listed in the packet, include aggregates for roadway, um, or excuse me, asphalt for roadway, aggregates for backfilling ex excavations, slurry, concrete, even decorative rock for, for landscape improvements. So approval of this item will award four unit price contracts to separate vendors to supply aggregate materials on an as-needed basis. Um, on February 1st and 8th, the city solicited uh, uh, bids for the aggregate materials and four bids were received on February 12th. Um, bids from all vendors include advantageous pricing for the various aggregates and therefore staff is recommending award to all vendors uh, once again on a no guaranteed as-needed <coughs> basis. <coughs> And with that, I'll open it up to any questions you may have. That's so beautiful. I think we've all uh, read the the package material on this. Mm -hmm. Any questions, uh, Charlie? Yeah, just a, one. a quick okay. one, Joel. Um, who are we buying our asphalt aggregate from under this contract? Uh, we have two potential vendors: CMEX and/or Asphalt Paving and Supply. Okay. Thank you. And uh, 
Is an arrowhead and asphalt paving and supply one and the same? Uh, they submitted separate bids, which are, they're allowed to under a solicitation. Arrowhead will not provide the, the asphalt material. I see. Um, Two separate material types. Yeah, correct. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Comments from the public? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Sandra Smith. I'm at 701 White's Bar. Um, just a question, kind of. Who are you getting your concrete from? The concrete comes from uh, CMEX and or asphalt okay. paving and supply. Those are the two vendors that did submit on the concrete. Okay, the reason I'm asking is a lot of places where sidewalks have been replaced, they're already starting to spall and they haven't even been in there like five years yet. Whereas older concrete is holding up much better. <laughs> if, you know, if I may answer that. Came from China. Um, it's, it's, there's an old, or it's a new adage in the past decade. Okay. There's two types of concrete. Concrete that hasn't cracked, and concrete that is cracked. So eventually it will all crack and pock. And it has to do with the mix no matter what plant you're going to, I can't find a good mix anywhere in, in the past seven, eight years, okay, no matter who you that, use. Okay, I just wondered about that because it seems it's like- It's the way they're stretching stuff. it cause, because the, the materials are getting more expensive. So they're, they're trying to thin it out, stretch it out. They add more uh, ash and, and, and whatnot to it. Okay, so. I just wondered about that. Thank you. Anyone else? Need a motion. Move to award a unit price contract to Arrowhead Mining and Materials in the amount not to exceed $100,000. City contract number 2015-111. Second. second. Motion made and seconded. Vote, please. Passes unanimously. Okay, item two. Move to award a unit price contract to Asphalt Paving and Supply Incorporated in the amount not to exceed $800,000. City contract number 2015-112. Second. Made and seconded. Vote, please. Passes six to one. Councilman Arnold dissenting. Three. Move to award a unit price contract to CMEX in amount not to exceed $800,000. City contract number 2015-113. Second. Second. Vote, please. Passes unanimously. Okay. Adam, four. Move to award a unit price contract to Material Delivery Incorporated DBI MDI Rock in amount not to exceed $75,000. City contract number 2015-114. Second. Vote. Passes unanimously. Okay. You may need the audition, uh, audition down at the state house. <laughs> oh, that hurts, that Mayor. That really hurts, there. <laughs> okay. Item 2H, approval amendment number one to city contract number 2012-105A with the Weber Group LC for emergency well maintenance and repairs on call services in an amount not to exceed $50,000. Thank you. This item is to award a contract amendment for performing on-call major emergency work and other repairs to the city's water production wells, which are beyond uh, city staff capabilities. The city currently operates six, soon to be seven, groundwater production wells for potable water supply. And to strengthen our, our emergency response and, and bolster our capabilities in responding to uh, uh, the types of repairs that are necessary, uh, the city needs a contract to perform <coughs> those efforts. Mm. Um, and, and for that reason, this contract is being recommended. Um, the Weber Group has uh, specialized equipment that's needed to perform these, uh, this work. Um, that's equipment the city does not have and would not be efficient for the city to buy. Um, I will note that there are no price increases with this contract amendment, and uh, the contractor, as indicated in the council communication, is required to respond within 24 hours. With that, I'll answer any questions you might have. I just have one question for you, Joel. Yes. Is this a retainer fee? So let's say we don't use them. Do they keep the 50 grand? No, that uh, it is strictly on call. If, if we don't need their services, we don't pay them anything. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Councilor or audience, okay. Need a motion. Mayor, I move to approve amendment number one to city contract number 2012105A with Weber Group LC for emergency well maintenance and repairs on call services in amount not to exceed $50,000. Second. Motion made and seconded. Let's vote, please. Passes okay. unanimously. 
Aye. Item 2I, award of a multi-year unit price contract to Hill Brothers Chemical Company for the purchase of chlorine materials in a total amount not to exceed $135,000, city contract <coughs> number 2015-115. This item is to award a uh, unit price contract to Hill Brothers for three commodities as listed in the council communication. The gas chlorine is used at the Sundog wastewater treatment plant for disinfection of the effluent. The calcium hypochlorite is a granular material that we broadcast throughout uh, <laughs> our processes to control algae growth. And the sodium hypochlorite is more or less an insurance blanket in case we have issues out at our airport water reclamation facility uh, where we have an on-site uh, chlorination generating unit. Um, so on January 25th and February 1st, we advertised this and received uh, three responses on February 12th. And um, the lowest responsive bidder is Hill Brothers. Uh, the city has been doing business with Hill Brothers for a number of years. And um, by competitively bidding this, uh, we did see bids come in slightly lower than our previous contract, so we'll see um, some savings. And with that, I'll answer any questions you have. Council. Public. Okay. Need a motion. Move to award a multi-year unit price contract to Hill Brothers Chemical Company for the purchase of chlorine materials in a total amount not to exceed $135,000. City contract number 2015-115. Second. Motion made and seconded. Vote. Okay. <coughs> Passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay. Mayor, I need to step out for the next item, and I may miss item K. Uh, Mr. City Attorney, can I cast my vote for that? Um, I'm going to be a few minutes. So it's just going to be recorded on item K as a absent. 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 Okay, I'll I'll be back. Perfect. Perfect. Give me a prompt. Going to fix dinner already. <laughs> item two J, award of bid con bid and contract for construction of the Willow Creek water main replacement and scour protection project to fan contracting in an amount not to exceed four hundred ninety nine thousand eight hundred twenty five dollars. City contract number two zero one five one zero one. Go ahead, please. Great, thank you. Um, in 2005, a uh, significant flood event occurred on Willow Creek that exposed uh, some water lines, uh, transmission lines in Willow Creek. And uh, subsequent to that, studies were done that indicated that the water lines should be replaced and uh, protected uh, with a sheet pile uh, structure. Uh, also, there is a sewer main, a 12-inch sewer main in the same area that needs to be protected as well. This project is to uh, relocate the water lines and sewer line and to uh, put them deeper uh, and cover it with concrete to protect it from okay. further damage, yes. Um, in January 4th and 11th, uh, it was out for a public bid. On the 22nd, nine bids were received, and fan contracting was the lowest uh, parent bidder, everything checked out on their bid, and the engineer's estimate was uh, higher than the low bid. Uh, I'm here to answer any other questions you may have. Council? Geomorphology. Okay, if not, uh, accept the motion. Mayor. I'm oh, excuse me. Any comment from the public? I'm sorry, I'm new. Go ahead. Mayor Pro Tem. I move to award city contract number 2015-101 for construction of the Willow Creek water main replacement and scour protection project to fan contracting incorporated in an amount not to exceed $499,825. Second. Motion been made and seconded. Let's vote, please. And just for the record, the clerk, um, Councilman Arnold, I think, declared a conflict. That was he, just missed that. Right. So it passes five to zero. Councilman Arnold declared a conflict of interest. Uh, Mayor Clerkendall, absent excused. Okay, item 11K. Item 2K for award of K. city contract number 2015-102 for construction of the South Dexter Neighborhood Road Improvement Project at Asphalt Paving and Supply Incorporated in amount not to exceed $195,533. Great, thank you. Uh, this project is another construction project uh, in the South Dexter neighborhood. Uh, we uh, applied for a CDBG uh, block grant uh, uh, that will be funding a majority of this project. Uh, it is to repair and upgrade uh, two streets, short and mini streets, along with some minor utilities. 
Uh, it also is to improve service connections for the Habitat for Humanity project that's on that corner. The, um, in, also in January, the, uh, the project was out for bid for, two, uh, for several weeks. Seven bids were uh, provided. Uh, Asphalt uh, Paving and Supply uh, Inc. Uh, was the apparent low bidder. Their bid was evaluated and everything uh, checked out. And the engineer's estimate was above uh, that uh, low uh, bid. Uh, I'm here to answer any questions on this project as well. I just have a comment. Henry, you're just taking this like a Band-Aid and just ripping this off today, aren't you, with everything? <laughs> Mayor, I'd uh, like to move. Let's go to the public. Any comments on the uh, that project? My name is Daniel Matson. I noticed Miriam Hobrick was here earlier, but for some reason she's left. Um, yeah, I think anything we can do to speed up this process is a great thing. I've been up in that area many a time looking at the project, and uh, I'm real happy to see this moving forward because uh, we could use these six affordable housing units. And in fact, I brought someone with me who's applied for that, and uh, you know, we'd all like to see this go forward. So, okay. thank you. Thank you, Dan. Anyone else? The public. Okay. Mayor, I move to award city contract number 2015-102 for construction of the South Dexter Neighborhood Road Improvement Project to Asphalt Paving and Supply Incorporated in the amount not to exceed $195,533,000. Second. Motion made and seconded. Vote, please. Passes okay. unanimously. Then am I a vote on J. Would you yes. Item 2L, legislative update. Thank you, Mayor and Council, uh, Councilman Lamerson, your favorite item is before you now. I, I noticed how excited you got when I came forward to talk about the legislative update. So I'll direct <laughs> this information to you. Um, probably the most exciting thing that has happened over the last few days is that um, the legislature has passed a state budget. That happened about 5.30 in the morning on Saturday after they were in session for three days approximately. Um, the highlights from that for cities and towns um, is that the Governor Ducey budget was uh, pretty much intact for cities and towns. A couple of positive notes, uh, charge for 76 cents per resident for the non-program cities of which uh, the city of Prescott is one. We self-collect our tax right now um, for one year for the implementation of the TPT simplification, um, otherwise known as state collection, um, was approved um, and that would start January 1st, 2016. Um, so that would be by population. Um, that was the same as was in the Ducey budget. Um, an allocation of 20.8 million to cities, towns, and counties for uh, Department of Revenue operations. Um, was also put into session law, which means that it would need to go forward again in the budget next year if it was to be continued. There's not a split yet between the cities and town, uh, cities and counties, uh, but once that split um, is defined in a mutual um, understanding, then the city portion would be distributed amongst all of the 91 cities and towns based on population. Um, and then um, I would note that there was originally a charge of about $2 million, um, of which 500000 would have been attributed to cities and towns for the Department of Revenue to fund um, increased collections, and that was not included in the final budget. So um, not a huge impact to cities and towns uh, as far as the Ducey budget is concerned. Uh, obviously, there are other state programs, et cetera, that were impacted that will have some trickle-down effects on some of the operations that we have. Um, the Department of t uh, the Tourism funds that typically flow down. There, there are going to be some impacts that we see flowing down, but not directly to cities and towns. Um, additionally, I wanted to highlight a couple of other bills. Um, House Bill 2008 was the striker um, by Representative Shope um, regarding fireworks and uh, requiring that they be allowed to be sold and used during certain periods. Um, unless there is a stage one fire restriction or higher in place that did pass House Third Read very close, um, 32 to 27. Um, so it would move on to the Senate, but it needs to get a Senate committee by, it needs to get through a Senate committee by the end of next week. Um, House Bill 2570, which uh, would have, 
would uh, limit our vegetation requirements that we have right now that is related to water use. Um, we also have certain vegetation requirements for new development based on the wildland urban interface code has not been to third read yet. Um, so we're hoping that that will not move forward, but that is something that uh, we would be opposed to. We obviously are required to meet certain um, water assurances by the state. And so not having as many tools to meet those requirements is something that um, does not make a lot of sense. Uh, Senate Bill 1079, solid waste collection for multifamily housing um, was amended in uh, House Energy and Environment this past Monday. Um, it's a, a slightly positive. It would require that multifamily property provide um, a city provider at least 60 calendar days of notice if they were going to terminate service. Um, however, quite a number of cities are still opposed to that based on the impacts to service levels uh, for other users of the uh, solid waste stream. We haven't seen anything uh, out of the governor's office regarding Senate Bill 1335 on fire access roads. It appears that the sponsor has not sent that up to the governor yet, which is a good sign um, for, for being able to address that on the House side. Um, again, no movement for municipal tax exemption for residential lease, um, but there still is a bit of time over the next week and a half where that could technically move. And then finally, House Bill 2563, um, which is uh, Campbell's sponsored bill regarding health facilities and substance abuse recovery did pass a uh, third read today in the House on a vote of uh, 40 yeas, 20 nays, and it will be um, going over to the Senate. It needs to get a Senate committee hearing and get through that hearing by March 20th in order to keep moving in the process. So we do have a tight window between now and next Friday um, for that to move forward. And that's all I have, unless you have questions. Jim, did you want to make a motion on her presentation? Did she you? did it admirably. I, I love the way she just zipped right through it. Okay. Thank you. Good job, Allison. Thank you. Okay, we're down to item M. Item 2M, fiscal year 16 and subsequent budgets, council discussion, direction, and possible action. <coughs> <coughs> Don't everybody go at once. Charlie? I think Charlie's up. <coughs> Mayor, thank you. And I'm actually going to move down just because it's easier to put this on the overhead if that's all right with you. Okay. Great. So, Mayor, um, as I had mentioned at the last meeting, I think that this is an opportunity as a member of the council for us to give some direction to staff. Uh, as it relates to the budget, share some ideas, ask them to investigate options and come back and talk with us. Uh, we know that potentially we have a two and a half million dollar budget deficit from some of the actions the state is taking that we need to overcome. Um, beyond that, we need to find some ways to stabilize the city's revenue streams and or expenses going forward. So some of these ideas may be minute. Some of these ideas are a little bit bigger. Uh, some of them are for discussion and I'll entertain questions about where my mind is on some of this. But one that I've brought up before that I, I'd like to hit on again, I think as we look at this budget, we have to understand that the city management's also going to be creating a work program from that budget. And one of the things I wanna see included from our development services is adjusting of either our valuation schedule or our building fees to better represent cost recovery in that department. I don't think it's unreasonable for us to ask that we get to an average two week turnaround on permits. However, the reality is we can't afford to do that today. So if we wanna improve our service level and create additional revenue, we need to adjust that valuation. If a sales tax were to go forward on a $300,000 house at 1%, if you take 65% of that cost to build it, it's gonna cost $1,950 in additional fees to that buyer. If we increase our fees on a single family residence based upon valuation by anywhere from 500 to thousand dollars, it has a lesser impact, but it's creating additional revenue into that area that we need it. We are currently not, I don't wanna say turning a profit, but we are not breaking even in this service area. And I think it's important. Uh, the next item on the list for discussion, we recently approved uh, a fix to some engineering problems that were done in a subdivision in the past. Uh, we continue to be involved in lawsuits and fight with contractors over standards of development of city infrastructure projects. 
I think it's time that we move forward in adopting an updated drainage manual and engineering criteria manual or standards. Instead of saying we use YAG MAG and hopefully we'll find something in the middle that's acceptable. Uh, by doing this, my expectation is long term, we can reduce the instances of disputes with contractors that ultimately lead to lawsuits. At the same time, we can make it easier for people that want to do business in the city to have a clear understanding of what it is they need to do to build in the city of Prescott. The next item, library underwriting. This is something that is happening more and more if you research across the country what libraries are doing to find additional funding sources. Uh, this could include with our ebooks some form of, I, I hate the word advertising, that's what it is that's involved when you open an ebook. Uh, in addition to that, uh, had an opportunity to speak with the library director and with city management. An area that we might want to investigate this year is could we potentially partner for our library services with the school district? I don't know what that looks like, but the school district operates several independent libraries. There may be an op opportunity to consolidate and contract some of our services to them as a revenue generator for the city and a cost reducer for the um, school district. Public-private partnerships on city lands. Uh, Steve has brought this up numerous times that we do own land that we aren't currently using. We have land that is restricted. What opportunities do we have to pursue for a public-private partnership? Uh, there are things out by the airport, outside of the fence, where there might be an opportunity for some partnering that could either create uh, bed tax revenue, rental tax revenue, or sales tax. Again, we talk about it. I want this to be a priority in our budget going forward so that staff has clear direction from us that we want to be looking at these types of alternatives. Uh, there is approximately 13 acres at the airport located just north of the SeaTech building by what's called Bottleneck. Uh, there are parties that are interested in doing a ground lease and development of that property. I think it's in the city's best interest though that we move forward with a competitive RFP so that we can give an opportunity to anyone who wants to develop that property, create jobs, create revenue for the enterprise fund, as well as create opportunity for revenue through sales tax, et cetera. This was something that was discussed a few months ago. I'd like to see this become a reality and again, clear direction from this council to staff to move forward with an RFP. We have people that are currently developing at other airports that want to develop here but I think we should do it competitively to make sure we don't lose any other opportunity that may exist and that that way it's transparent. I've brought up adjusting internal service funds. This is a major chunk of what the city pays for city management, for city council, for HR, for finance. Uh, our enterprise funds have designated revenue streams and I encourage our staff and I know that they've heard this, they're looking at it. Uh, in this budget, I'd like to look at adjusting the formula we're using to put more of a burden on the uh, enterprise funds instead of the sales tax driven fund. I'd like to see before April 14th, this council take formal action to put something on the ballot related to a continuation of the streets tax. We have until the 14th to have it on the general, or excuse me, the primary, which is when we've scheduled the um, general plan to go forward. It's my belief that a continuation at our current capacity is a step in the right direction. And it's something that I, as a member of the council, would support putting on the ballot. Uh, we can discuss if that would be more, but we need to restore that quarter percent sales tax. We know we're not gonna stay up on our streets in fiscal year 16, 17. We already know that. And yes, for streets was successful before. My expectation is that if we continue with the current capacity, then we would be able to take a dent out of the streets. In no way will this address all of our street issues, but it certainly is a start, and I'd like to have that agendized on the next meeting so that we can take action and make sure that that gets taken care of. Our collection policies. Uh, currently, I'm aware that we have a very large outstanding bill with the Highland Pines Water District that needs to be addressed. Significant, and I'd like to see our current policies and how we can change our policies to increase our uh, recapture of revenue that's due to the city, whether it's independent departments or it's through finance, uh, the collection policy of a city is very important. How we use third parties, if we hire a third party, what percentage we get, how that brings money back to the city, 
Uh, that's an area that I'd like to discuss more and have staff give us a presentation on what our policy is and if we as a council need to tweak that policy. As I'm always reminded, we're policy focused in their administration. So I wanna make sure anywhere we can within our policies, we are giving them clear direction and, and the tools they need. Park user fee adjustments and partnering opportunities. I think our parks and rec department in the last few years has been a prime example of something that most from a budgetary standpoint would consider a black hole has turned around significantly to beginning to produce revenues to offset its operation. It draws tourism. It's an important part to our community. I think we need to look at a recommendation from staff to adjust our daily user fees at the parks. I think we need to still have our annual pass that is affordable for our residents, but we need to start bringing that into line with other recreation opportunities in the region that we currently are far behind. In addition to that, partnering opportunities. We talked about it. I want clear direction to staff to focus on what can we do to drive revenue opportunities within our recreation facilities that can help offset that demand in the general fund. Joe has some wonderful ideas about what to do at Watson Lake Park to increase its usership, to increase its revenue. If we're talking about finding $2 million, we're limited to the general fund where it's gonna come from. Here's an opportunity for us to create additional revenue to offset people that are specifically using those assets and keeping it affordable for our residents. Utility billing partnerships. Right now you can pay your city water bill here. Uh, APS is discussing moving their bill collection center out of downtown Prescott. They have in the past offered to look at partnering opportunities that could offset our costs in utility billing collection. They're looking for a place to put one of their bill collectors. If you're familiar with Unisource, there is nowhere to locally go to a window and pay your gas bill in Prescott. You can go pay it through a service or online, but they no longer offer the window. Uh, there might be an opportunity for us to pursue utility billing partnerships to offset that expense to the city in our enterprise fund that is providing a significant amount of service. So I would encourage our staff again to extend uh, a phone call out to APS and discuss whether or not a billing partnership could be a reality. Doesn't have a direct impact to the general fund, but it's an area that I think we could see some adjustment. Solid waste increased contributions to streets. If you recall, when we were dealing with the trash ordinance, solid waste has been paying some funds over to streets for their impact. What I would like to do is see that number increased, and then I would like to see funds within the streets fund earmarked specifically for asphalt and concrete asset repair within the city. So those are our parking lots. Those are the parking lots that we're using at the fire stations, at Parks and Rec. It's the roads within Parks and Rec as a funding mechanism, instead of tapping the general fund consistently to address that issue, this is a revenue stream that we can look at instead of that general funding. And we're already doing it. I think we could take an evaluation and see if there's an opportunity to do more. Uh, city code violations and city court, we've been talking about this. I, want it, I just wanna make sure it stays on the front burner. Uh, that's giving our code enforcement people the ability to cite into city court so that we can actively address uh, long-standing issues with code violations uh, and also take appropriate action. Online police reporting, I brought this up several times, communities are moving towards it. We're a very service-oriented community. You dial 911 or call the police, they're gonna show up and take your report. Uh, we recently saw some statistics from our police chief. If we can reduce the demand on the in-person services by offering an alternative, what it does is it frees up our officers to be focused on other priorities within the community. Um, if your car is broken into in a parking lot, you can contact the police department, they'll come out and take a report. Most of the time you're gonna end up doing that report for your insurance company. If I could go online and file that report, it would make it easier for me as an individual, reduce the pressures on our police department. And then I put in here task force because we've been talking about, we need a task force to go out there and, and do what we used to do and do 300 and something arrests a year. And this is important and this is something the council wants. I think we already have the task force in place. I think what we need to do is ha have a dialogue with our chief who is more than capable of giving the direction to his existing staff and we have a department that has the capability to focus their efforts. If you look at Sergeant Scott's community policing unit, uh, you mostly see them on bicycles, but at the same time, they also do high impact 
uh, prevention in parking lots where we did have a slew of break-ins and vehicles. They do undercover. They do a lot of different things that if we give them clear direction and we work with the person we rely on, which is our chief, to give them clear direction, I don't think we need to go spend 500 to 700,000 new dollars creating a task force that already exists. We have the capability. We need to address some of those issues so that they have the tools. They may come back and say we need an additional officer and we need the following tools. Let's empower them and make that happen. But let's do that for a cost of $70,000 instead of creating a whole new arm that is going to end up costing us long term. Um, so this is 13 of the 23 that I said I would be bringing back to you. Um, I didn't want to go on forever. I'm going to pass this to the city management. Um, a couple of these I would like to have come back at the next meeting so that we can give some direction. And with that, uh, I'll come back up here and answer any questions or open it up for discussion on some of these ideas. Jane. Well, I can't let the moment go by without commenting on the streets tax. <laughs> Let's not forget that that 1% is a streets and open space tax. We're losing the quarter cent that probably should be going to open space and hasn't been spent on it. I could support moving forward with a streets tax if we combine it with an open space tax too. <clears throat> so I would go to half a cent. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I'm told time and time again that the only reason that one cent tax passed is because of the people who supported open space. There are a whole lot of people out there that are, call themselves green voters, a whole lot of them. And they could carry this again. It's a tax increase, never <coughs> popular, a lot of negativity about that. But I think Henry Hash has made a compelling argument for why we need to increase or maintain a sales tax to support our streets program. And I'm an advocate for continuing our open space program. We've got a plan. It's there. We need to fund it. I like a lot of Charlie's suggestions. Um, I think that uh, utility billing partnership really offers a good opportunity. I, I know it's been done in Flagstaff for a number of years. And it is a cost saver to the city. Um, increasing solid waste contributions to the streets fund, great idea. I can tell you about a giant pothole that I have to look at every day in front of the dumpster next to my house, which was filled a couple years ago, and then within one month it became a pothole again because the garbage truck had to back in to unload the dumpster. Those trucks are heavy. They do a lot of damage, and I think <coughs> contributing to the streets fund is a really good idea. Um, library underwriting, I'd like to explore more of that. Um, I know when, we, when I go to Europe, uh, if I need to use an internet and I don't have a computer with me, I go to the library. But in Europe, you pay maybe a euro for 10 minutes on the, on the internet. No. Yeah. <laughs> Shocking, isn't it? Um, yeah. Um, it's an idea. The use of the internet um, is pretty popular in the library, and it is an expensive tool to purchase and maintain. I think we should look into it. I don't want to get into, uh, tread into territory where we're going to lose our uh, free library status and public funding, but something we can talk about. That's all I have to say. Okay. Just real quick, Charlie, good presentation. I agree with almost all if not some and less, but mostly all in all, great, great presentation. Uh, I'm all on board with what Steve was saying with the task force, but if there's another way and we get feedback from the chief on how that task force would would look like or what he can do, it, that'd be great. Um, as far as the, uh, the, the street tax, the open, the my opinion on a street tax, the viability of it going through is still questionable at this point in time, uh, but I could only, I would have to say bring forth two options, A, saying open space along with that, and the other saying just streets, and I'm just guessing what the majority would be, but um, I've, we've got five million acres around us that's open, so I could only support that going to the streets because that's where it's most needed. Well, I appreciate Gene bringing that, <clears throat> that up, but I, I'd be one to tell you that 
I don't think it's ever owed that we owe open space the right to be purchased. I think it's been left up to this council for the last many years, and I think we've done an admirable job of buying what was important to this community. And I suspect if they were separated, I will tell you which one would fail and which would pass. I don't agree with you, Gene, on that one. Um, I would also say that when you start talking about different ways to look outside of, of police enforcement, and I haven't brought this up to the chief or the city manager. I mentioned it to Joe Baines in passing today. I had the opportunity to go look at a couple of our pervert stations, and I'll call them public restrooms in the city, uh, that are under scrutiny uh, as far as remodeling and those types of things. And I asked the question about understanding you can't put a camera inside of a bathroom, but understanding that we can put a camera outside of the bathroom if it's monitored. And I would ask the question of the city manager as well as the police chief, as part of that special enforcement in our parks to make them safe, especially Granite Creek Park, but all of them, to be able to put up a, a camera outside of the restrooms and be able to monitor them through our, our um, communication center would at least give us a time frame that if there's some catastrophic incident or some graffiti or something that happens, it would give us a time frame to focus on our special enforcement group to take care of some of these activities that continue to go on. As a parent or as anybody using those facilities as a rental, I would hesitate to go into e any of those without a mask and rubber gloves. So when they come that concerning to me, I think we have an obligation as a community to clean them up. So I would suggest that maybe we look at some privatization of cameras outside of these restrooms uh, in some of our parks to be monitored by the dispatch center on a 24-hour basis. Mayor, I was just thinking if the people with electric cars would pay their fare of road tax, we could engineer the roads to support the garbage trucks, but I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> Charlie, I think uh, you did a great job. Uh, this, this brings up a good point. You know, the deficits are looking so big, and, and from the state to the feds to us, everyone's looking to uh, make some big stride to get back in shape, but we can't stop forgetting to trim the fat if there is any fat out there. So uh, a lot of those ideas are great. They, they're they out-of-the-box thinking, and, uh, and I support almost all of them. Jim. Thank you, Mayor. I uh, kind of liked a little bit of what everybody else had to say. Um, I'm on board with the idea of a special type of task force in the police to try and enforce some of what we need to be enforced with regards to codes and law breaking and all that stuff. A few more dogs, the ability to have dogs alert and what have you down in the parks or uh, walking through Walmart or wherever the case would be, but have some dogs as a tool to help the cops. They need them. Um, I think uh, similar to what whoever has said, we got the guys on the force already to do it. They're trained. But I feel that way about the fire department and mitigation of fuel wood and all that other stuff. Um, I think we got the guys that are adequately trained to go take care of what needs to be trained, uh, taken care of in the city, take care of the city. Uh, rights away in the city's open space and everything else to keep us fire wise. We got the code in the, the deal and we do have opportunities through code enforcement to tag folks who are creating a public health and safety issue for other folks by, by having a fire hazard in their yard or whatever. Um, I think that um, we do need to keep care of our roads and I'll go back to 12 years ago and 10 years ago and eight years ago and blah, 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 when public work director after public work director told us we don't have enough money with a full one cent to take care of the roads. And then somebody promoted the idea of taking 25% of that capability away too. And um, I think our roads people have done a great job with what they've had to work with. I'm a little bit nervous about long range projects and being able to pay the bill back, especially if we borrow money for them. Um, but I've shared all these thought processes. I agree with Charlie on some of his thought processes with uh, land and assets that we own in the city being not used favorably or the best and highest use for the citizens of Prescott. I see some camping opportunities that we can collect both bed tax and sales tax within the city uh, through, you know, those trailers, homes, whatever you call those things that people pull up here from all over the planet and put over here and here and here. RVs, that's what they are, they're RVs. And that gives us an opportunity to do some things out at our parks a little differently than we're doing. 
<laughs> and um, maybe we need to invest in some of the infrastructure that the citizens have bought and paid for. I think we paid, I don't know, I can't remember, with interest around 30, 35 million for those two reservoirs. And yet we haven't done anything with them, but leave them set there for the bird watchers and the hikers. But there's other things that we can do with them differently. And we need to take a look at that. And maybe if we took a look at what we could do down at Granite Creek Park differently, uh, just by the presence of people down there, you might get rid of some of the bad behavior that takes place in some of these, um, well, they're not remote, they're areas of entertainment, so to speak. And I, I know what Steve's saying about the supermarket for perverts, et cetera, because they're all over town like that in certain areas where people deal drugs or whatever the case would be. And police chief knows exactly what I'm saying. And we should have the tools in the toolbox to clean that mess up. And the sooner we have it, the happier I'll be. Craig, it would seem to me that uh, the list, there are some, maybe some action items, maybe there's some uh, studies, um, action or study, uh, things we need to talk about. So uh, we've got two weeks before we have another meeting. And uh, so maybe uh, just some type of a comment sheet on, on uh, what your feelings might be on the different ones. And uh, uh, the council, you know what it takes to get something on the agenda? Uh, so uh, let's, let's leave it at that. And uh, uh, let staff take a look at it. And uh, obviously some of it is for budget time once we get start talking about money and uh, other things uh, maybe we ought to take a look at. Uh, I agree on the street, the street proposal. Uh, I don't even look at it as a tax increase. I look at it as, as revenue retention yeah. uh, for generally the same purpose we've been using it for the last, uh, last few years. So uh, with that said, uh, unless there's something else, why? We're going to be out of here. You, you have a comment? Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Perry. Um, I'm a long-term uh, Prescott resident, and uh, I'm also involved in uh, some of the local political clubs. And uh, I agreed with almost everything Charlie said. I think it'd be really cool if we used uh, a different way to utilize some of our assets. That way, we wouldn't have to necessarily raise taxes on the revenue side. But um, I, do, uh, I do know we have raised property taxes a couple times in the last several years. And I think uh, with those tax increases, it would be cool if we uh, didn't raise sales tax. And I, think, uh, I don't think that open spaces is a reason to uh, raise sales tax. And that's uh, my personal viewpoint. And uh, I would like us to use those other revenue increasing ways to raise money for roads or pensions or what have you. And if possible, I would not like to see an increase in the sales tax. And I wanted to come up here and use this privilege to say that. And thank you guys for having me. Great. Thank you. I have a hunch that uh, we'll all get a lesson in what being frugal is this year. So, uh, and we'll be digging into it here in the next three or four weeks. So, uh, that said, 